What we're going to do is something we did not do this morning, but I warned you all about. And that is looking at Islam from a historical perspective. We're now going to change gears and ask the hard questions. And these are the questions that aren't being asked, but need to be. And for most of you, this is the first time you've seen it. So don't look at me. Look at the screens. All right? There's about 86 slides we're going to go through. So just follow through it. Everything is on the screens, and we're going to zip through it, and I'm going to try to unpack it, and then I'm going to ask you two questions, but then I want you to throw questions at me if you have any problem. Don't take notes. You're not going to have time to take notes. We're going to go too fast. Just sit back and watch the screen. So the truth about Islam's origins. This is the newest polemic. Uh, this is the external polemic. This is the historical polemic that most of you have not heard about yet. Now, why? Why in the world are we doing historical polemics? Why are we even caring about that? Well, there, as I said earlier, there are three areas of polemics, three genres of polemics. One is the internal polemics. Now, polemics means going on the offense. That means we're confronting, we're engaging, we're actually asking difficult questions of Islam. Internal polemics is just looking at the Quran and reading it in the, of the Quran that's in your hand in front of you. Looking at Muhammad and looking at his life. You're not asking whether or not he existed or not. You're looking and seeing what he did, what he said, and whether that's relevant for today. That's called internal polemics. That's what we've been doing for hundreds of years. That's what I did for most of my 40 years. For 30 years, I asked questions about Muhammad and I asked questions about the Quran. And then I compared Muhammad to Jesus and I compared the Quran to the Bible. That's the internal part. That's what you've all been told. That's what you've all been taught. That's the only thing you see on YouTube. That's the internal polemics. The second is the cultural polemics where we go one step further and we ask what is Islam doing today in the 21st century? What is it doing in Afghanistan, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in those countries that claim to be Islamic? Are they relevant? Are they working? And we're looking at the political setup. We're looking at the, the whole financial structure. We're looking at the social fabric of those countries. And we're seeing that they're decimating every one of these countries. And that's why so many of them are coming this direction. They want to come to the West. They want to come to America. They want to come to Europe. Why? Because something here that they don't have there. And that's the cultural mandate. And that's why we need to engage with that. So these two are very important, but they're the only two that we've been, ever been using. And the problem with these two kinds of polemics, it's that close to hate speech. And that's what people are calling Islamophobia. That's what people don't like. Because you're confronting not only the people, you're confronting the persons, but you're especially confronting the prophet. You don't touch Muhammad. There's a visceral hatred of anybody that says anything against Muhammad. Oh, you can confront the Quran. They're not going to say too much. You can confront Allah. But once you touch Muhammad, you saw what happened in the Muhammad cartoons. You saw what happened with the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. You die. You get killed. So no one wants to go down that route anymore. This is too dangerous. I did this for 30 years. I got beat up. I got my glasses broken. They tried to open up my throat. I got bloodied because of these two types of polemics. There is a third now, and that's what we're going to do tonight. The external polemics. This is the historical polemics. We're not even looking at the Quran. I'm not going to open up its pages and read it like I did this morning. I'm not going to be asking questions about what Muhammad did back then or whether or not Muhammad's relevant for today. I don't care diddly swat about those questions. I'm asking a much deeper question, a much more simple question. Did he exist? Three words. Did he exist? Ooh, doo -doo -doo. If he didn't exist, then why are we wasting our time talking about him? If he didn't exist, then who cares what he did here, there, or other? Who cares what he said if he didn't exist? Can you see, this is much more damaging. Now notice, this is not Islamophobia. This is not hate speech. It's a perfectly legitimate question. It's the same question that was asked of Jesus Christ in the 1800s. Did Jesus exist? They're still asking that today. Did he die on the cross? Did he rise again? Can we trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Can we trust our scriptures? These are normal questions. They're good questions. And we have answered every one of those questions. We're so far ahead of the game. Only Christianity has asked questions about its foundations. Only for 200 years have we been answering those questions about our foundations. Now we're asking the same questions about Islam. 
And don't start with Islam. You also have to do the same thing with the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and the Vedas of Hinduism. You need to do with the Granth Sahib of the Sikhs. You need to do this with the Mormons. You need to do this with Jehovahism. Any ism, any belief system that has a revelation and has a model that they follow, you can ask these questions of that I'm going to ask tonight. Are you ready? Okay, let's go ahead and let's see what we're going to find. So to do that, looking at external protocol X, we're confronting the existence of the book, the man in the place. That's what I call it, the book, the man in the place. That's my, my, my words for it. It's very easy. It just drips out of your mouth. The book, the man in the place. The book, the Quran, the man, Muhammad in the place, my Mecca. Those are the three things we're going to ask tonight. Confronting Mecca historically. Did it exist in the 7th century or before? Confronting Muhammad historically. Did he exist in the 7th century in Mecca and Medina? And confronting the Quran historically. Did it exist in the 7th century and has it been preserved perfectly for the last four hundred years. Conclusion, this form of polemics confronts the very foundations of Islam without confronting the people or their revelation or their prophet and lowers the anger level. And that's why it's so easy, as you're going to find as you sit through tonight. Now, why the historical critique? Number one, everything we use tonight, everything I'm going to ask comes from the 7th and 8th centuries. I'm not going to waste your time with the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. I let the Muslims deal with that. You're going to see why I say that in about 15 minutes. So therefore, everything we're going to find, everything that we're going to use has nothing to do with silence. I did a debate back in 1995 with Dr. Uh, Jabal Badawi, the Laurel's leading authority at Cambridge University at that time. We did a debate in August of two, 1995, and I asked 10 historical questions about Islam, about Muhammad, and about the Quran. This is where I got started, that 1995. Dr. Jamal Badari, the world's leading authority, had never heard these questions before, but he turned to me at the end of the debate and he said, Mr. Smith, everything you're arguing from is from silence. But the absence of evidence doesn't prove the evidence of absence. And he was right. He hung me just on that one phrase. Just because there's no evidence doesn't mean it's not going to show up at some point or some time. Well, they've been waiting 1,400 years and they still haven't found it. But there he had me. That was in 1995. Watch what we now have today. And that's what we're going to do in the next hour and a half. Look at the evidence we have. No longer are we arguing from silence. And the absence of evidence is now on their foot. We've turned the whole thing completely on its head. No longer are we arguing from silence. They are arguing from silence. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Hold on. You'll see why as we go through. Secondly, it confronts the very foundations of Islam, the book of the man. Without the book, without the man, there is no Islam. If you don't have the Quran, you don't have Muhammad, what do you have left? Nothing. And we would say the same thing about Christianity. Without the Bible and Jesus Christ, what would we have left? Diliswar. Nothing. We're just like them. We start from the same paradigm. They start with one book, we start with another book. They start with one man, we start with a better man. And that's why we need to confront those two. It's neutral. I mean, in other words, everything I'm going to use tonight, anybody could use. You don't have to be a Christian to use this material. But I'm going to have something to say about that at the very end. It doesn't attack Muslims, so it's not hate speech. It's politically correct. It's not Islamophobic. Now that I've been working on this, and I've been using this now for the last 10 years, but especially since COVID, for the last four years, I have been going so fast, so quick. We're getting so much new material. Something I'm, some of the material I'm going to show tonight is the first time anybody's seen it. You're going to be the first to see it. That's how quick this is moving. It's going so quick. And that's why, folks... Anybody could use it, but hold on a minute. I'm going to stymie that in just about another hour, but we'll wait for that. It's also easy to communicate. Communicate Everything, all the arguments are going to be on the screen. And if I give you the PowerPoint, and we're going to give it to you free, any of you want it, it's going to be on the computer up there. You can just go get it. Use this PowerPoint. It's for you. It's not for me. It's for everybody. More than that, we have the best and the only antidote. We're the only ones that have an answer to everything we're going to show tonight. Because while we shut down their book, their man in the place, we're the only ones that have a better book, a better man in a better place. We need to bring him home. We need to bring him home. Okay? And we're finding hundreds who are coming to Christ using this new polemics. And we're, not, we're looking for those who are not Saul's, I'm sorry, who are not the social misfits. We're looking for the Saul's who are becoming Paul's. These are the kind of converts we're getting. Because they come through propositional truth, not because they've just been loved into the kingdom, but because they've been persuaded. So what does external polemics include? 
four areas, and we're going to cover these four areas tonight. First, we're going to start with the problem of the sources. Then we're going to go to the problem of Mecca. And then we're going to go to the problem with Muhammad. And we're going to go to the problem with the Quran. End with the Quran. You might say, hold on, am I just turning everything on its head? Yes, I have. It should be the book, the man, and the place, right? But I'm starting with the place, the man, and the book. Why am I going backwards? You'll see. There's a reason why I'm doing this. Watch the videos on Fander Films to see these arguments laid out in full, because we're going to go through very quickly tonight. These are much broader and much more in-depth on Fander Films on YouTube. And let's see quickly why each area is so potent for polemics. Now, this is what the Muslims say, and this is what every Muslim says, whether they are nominal or, sorry, nominal or liberal or radical. Radical here on the right. The nominals in the middle, maybe not the liberals, maybe I better hold off the liberals. Liberals will not say this, but they only make up about 1% of all Muslims. It's the nominals and the radicals who say these things. Number one, that the Quran is the word of God, has always been the word of God, eternal word of God, never been created. That Muhammad is the man that received the Quran, therefore he is the model for all of mankind, for all peoples, all places, in all times. And that Mecca is the place where it all happened. Mecca is where the place where Muhammad lived, where he received the Quran for the first 12 years of his life, before he went to Medina. Therefore, that book, that man, and that place are absolutely foundational for everything that Muslims believe. Since these three areas are foundational to Islam, we should therefore investigate them at the time they existed, at the seventh century. This is all happening in the seventh century, 600 AD, in the place they existed, in that central part of Arabia called the Hijaz, that western central part of Arabia. So let's review the problem of sources. Let's start with the sources and then move to Mecca. Why the sources? Because you want to know where it all comes from. Where does everything Muslims know today, where does it come from? Now before that, let's look at a map. To understand that, you need to look at this map here. And I want to show you this right here. That brown area right there, that is where Islam began. According to Muslim standard Islamic narrative, according to Islam itself, what the Muslim scholars tell you, that brown area there, by 632, that was all that Islam uh, controlled. When Muhammad died in 632, he was born in 570, started receiving revelations in 610, and for the next 22 years, by the time he died in 632, he controlled this brown area here, okay? Not very big, is it? But notice, it's in Western Arabia, middle and southern part of Arabia. Once he died in 632, then you have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the first, the next four rightly guided caliphs. These are the caliphs that lived in Medina and did all their work in Medina, but they then expanded the borders, and that's called the Rashidun period, the period of the rightly guided caliph, and they expanded the borders into the orange area that you see there, from Afghanistan over here to Tripoli in the west, from Turkey down to Yemen in the south, okay? There's Afghanistan, there's Tripoli, there's Turkey, and there's Yemen down here. That is the area they expanded to, the orange area. Then after... These rightly guided caliphs, every one of them, three of them were killed, one uh, died normally. And then you have the Battle of Siphon when Mu'awiyah comes to power and he introduces and inaugurates the Umayyad dynasty. And the Umayyad dynasty went from 661 to 750. So from 661, that's the mid 7th century, up until the mid 8th century, you have the purple area here. That's what they expanded to. So from India in the east, all the way to Spain in the west, and then of course from the Yemen and Oman in the south up to Turkey in the north. That's the area that comes during the Umayyad dynasty. I'm not really interested in the purple area. I'm really only interested for tonight in the brown and the orange area. Can you memorize the map? Look at the map, get it in your mind. Don't look at me, look at the map. Try to memorize it. That's what I'm gonna look at. We're gonna look at the brown area and we're gonna look at the orange area because that is how Islam began according to all the Islamic traditions. So let's look at a timeline. We need to see what they say. This is what the Islamic traditions, the standard Islamic narrative. Isn't that interesting? Standard Islamic narrative, S-I-N. What does that spell? Bingo, you got it. So according to Sin, this is what they tell us. Muhammad was born in 570. He started receiving the Quran when he moved. He was living there in Mecca, started receiving it in the Hira cave in 610. And then in 621, 11 years later, he was 
uh, woken up in the middle of the night, went on the back of a winged horse and flew up to Jerusalem, went right up to the seven heavens and met Allah. And there Allah sold him to pray 50 times a day. He came down to the fifth heaven, met Moses, and said, ah, way too many prayers. See if you can get it back down again. So he bounces back and forth between the seventh and the fifth heaven, getting it from 50 prayers to 45, down to 30, down to 15, down to five prayers. Once he got it to five prayers, Moses says, ah, go on back down to earth. So he comes back down to Jerusalem, gets back on the winged horse, and flies back down to Mecca. Now that's called a mirage, and that's why the Dome of the Rock was built, right? That's why they built it there. Abdul Malik in 691 built the Dome of the Rock to commemorate the mirage. One huge problem. There's nothing written about it on the Dome of the Rock. Not one word on all the inner ambulatories, which is the original part of the building. So what's the Dome of the Rock doing? We'll get to that. Hold on. Oh, anyways, that's according to the standard Islamic narrative happens in 621. Then in 622, he then moves from Mecca, moves to Medina. It's called the Hijrah, with about 80 to 200 of his followers, and that begins the Islamic state. He now moves to Medina, takes over Medina, and from 622, he is the caliph until 632. And there in 632, well, let's before that, 630, he comes back to Mecca, takes over Mecca without firing a shot, and then in 632, he dies, poisoned by one of his wives. That's his life. So from 570 to 632, that's their story. Not my story, that's everything you've heard. Now after he dies, Abu Bakr takes over. He lasts for only two years before he dies naturally. In 634 he dies, then Umar takes over and only lasts about 10 years. And then he is killed in 644, but he expands the borders quite a bit during his reign. And then when he is killed, Uthman takes over. He lasts only 12 years before he is killed. But while he is in power, in 652 he creates this book called the Quran. On. This is the book he creates. This is the book that comes from Uthman, according to Islam. 652, you'll hear that date again. And then when he is killed in 656, Ali, the adopted wife, uh, the adopted son of Muhammad, takes over. He only lasts five years before he is killed by Mu'awiyah at the Battle of Sifan in 661. There it is, folks. That's the timeline of the origins of Islam, according to to the standard Islamic narrative. Therefore, the conclusion, Islam was fully formed in the Hijaz by 661. Within 40 years of Muhammad's death, everything was in place. So everything we need to know about how Islam began happened in the first 40 years. Have you heard any other story? No, that's the only story that's out there. Until tonight, that's everything you've been told. No, I'm just giving you the bare bones. I'm not giving you everything. We don't have time, I've gotta got get a plane. So, let's continue on. Question, how do we know anything of the above? How do we know what, whether any of those events happen? Where did all this, these stories come from? Well, you would like to say it came from people who were actually there, right? Who actually saw these events happen, correct? We have that with Jesus, don't we? Matthew and, G and, pa and John were right there, were they not? Watching Jesus, they were there for the last three years. Were they not eyewitness to everything they wrote and saw? Yeah. Of course they were. Mark and Luke got it from the eyewitnesses. So we have two eyewitnesses and those who got it from the eyewitnesses who were actually in the same place looking and see what Jesus said, looking and see what Jesus did, and they wrote down what he said and did. Right? You would expect the same thing for Islam. Certainly someone should have been there. So what do the Muslims tell us? What does Islam tell us? Who was there? You would hope eyewitnesses because we're only talking about 1400 years ago, not 2000 years ago, only 1400 years ago. All right, let's see what the Islamic, standard Islamic narrative tells us. And here we go. Standard Islamic says this, according to their traditions, this is what they say. Muhammad was dead by 632, right? So who wrote down his story? Well, that's known as the Siratul Rasulullah, which means the biography of the prophet Muhammad written down by whom? By this guy here, Ibn Isak. Look at his dates. It's hard to see, isn't it? You have to really look hard. I've done that purposely. You'll see why. He is the guy that wrote it down. But hold on a minute. Look at when he died, 765. Muhammad died in 632. Was he eyewitness to anything he saw? Absolutely not. But we have nothing from Ibn Ishaq. There's not one page of any book, of any manuscript written by him. So where do we get the biography of Muhammad? The Siratul Rasulullah. Where do we get it? We get it from this guy here, Ibn Hisham. 
He is the one that takes what Ibn Ishaq said, doesn't like a lot what he says, he throws it out and only retains what he wants and that's the biography that we have in our hand today. And that's the one that all of you read and that's the one I had to read. And then we also go to Al-Wakiri, he's the other one that has the battles of Muhammad. Those are the three, two men who write down the biography. But nothing comes from Ibn Ishaq. So what should we do with Ibn Ishaq? Let's just get rid of him, goodbye, boom, and he's gone. That's why you can't see him. There's nothing written by him. It all comes from these two men. But look at their dates, 833, 835. Muhammad died in 632, do your maths. Did these men know Muhammad? Did they see anything that Muhammad did? Did they hear anything Muhammad said? Hold on, what about what Muhammad said? To get to that, you need to go to a whole other genre called the Hadith. You need to go to the sayings of Muhammad. And the first to write him down is a guy named Al-Buhari who died in 870. That's 240 years after the fact. And then you need to go to Sahih Muslim, 875. Il-Tabirdi, 884. Ab Ibn Majah, 887. Abu Dawud, 889. An-Nisai, 915. Now we're into the 10th century. Everything that Muhammad said was written by those who were living in the 9th and 10th century. That's two to 300 years too late. But we still have two other genres, folks. We have the tafsir and the tahrik. The tafsir are the commentaries that explain the Quran, and the tahrik are the histories of all of mankind. Where do they come from? The first to write them down is a guy named Al-Tabari who died in 923. That's the 10th century. That's two, three, did I say 200 years? 300 years too late. Everything we know about Muhammad comes from 200 years and later. Now, I want to just put this guy up here, Abdul Malik, because he is the first one to actually introduce the word Muhammad. Muhammad. Did I say Muhammad or Muhammad? I said Muhammad, didn't I? Ooh, that's going to have a huge importance later on in our talk. But he is the first one that introduces that name. Now, look when he introduced it. He introduces it on the Dome of the Rock and on some coins in 691. Muhammad died in 632. This is 60 years after that time. But the people that actually give us the Muhammad of today, (coughs) the people that actually we go to to find out who Muhammad is, what he did, and what he said, are these people, the Abbasids, who come to power in around 750, 749 to be exact. That's the mid-8th century. Muhammad died in the uh, early uh, 7th century, so they're 150 years too late. Conclusion? Muhammad was revealed 84 years after the Abbasids created him, 141 years after he was first introduced, yet 201 years after he supposedly lived. These are all too late, much too late. These are not eyewitness accounts, not 200 years, not 300 years after the fact. To be even more devastating, look and see where these men were living when they did this. Well, let's talk about the Islamic traditions themselves. According to what they tell us, they say that everything happened around those two green circles. That's Mecca and Medina. Those are the two cities where Muhammad lived. That's where the Quran was revealed, (coughs) Mecca and Medina. Yet when you look at all of the writers, they did the writing in Baghdad, which is about 1,200 miles to the north. When you look at Hisham, Ibn Hisham, he was born in Basra, he grew up in Cairo, he did his writing in Baghdad. Cairo is 990 miles away, Basra is 1,200 miles away, and so is Baghdad, way up to the north, nowhere near where he should have been to write down what, what Muhammad did or what Muhammad said. When you talk about Al-Buhari, who is writing what Muhammad said, well, he was born in Buhara, which is in Uzbekistan. That's 2,600 miles away. And our good friend Al-Tabari, who gives us the tafsir and the tahrik, he was living way up in Tabaristan, which is in northern Iran today. That's 1,700 miles away. Conclusion, none of the traditional writers lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from the west and east of Baghdad. Note, these are all All of these works originated from the Abbasid. These are all Abbasid writers from 750 AD and onwards. Now, if you want to look and see what we have, because we have the same genre in the Christianity. We have the Siddha of Jesus, the the biography of Jesus written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, correct? That's the black letter part of the gospel account. We also have the Hadith of Jesus. That would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written in red letters. When every time Jesus spoke, you write it in red letters, at least in my Bible. So there's the Hadith of Jesus, right? We also have the Tafsir of Jesus. That would be the commentaries of Paul's letters who took what Jesus said and applied it to Ephesus and to Corinth and to Philippi. So we have also the Tafsir of Jesus. And we also have the Tahrik, which would be the history of the early church in the book of Acts. So we've got the same exact same genre. But look and see when they were written. Everything we know that was written about the Sirah and the Tafsir and the Hadith and the Tariq of Jesus, everything was written between 
20 years after Christ's death up until 90 AD. Within 60 years of Christ's death, everything was written down. Written by those who are eyewitnesses to what they saw or heard it from the eyewitnesses. And they all lived where Jesus lived. Not hundreds of miles away. Not thousands of miles away. So when you do a comparison between Christianity and Islam, just doing a comparison, when you look at the two, Christianity is written all of everything we know about Jesus Christ, his hadith, his tafsir, his tariq, and his sirah. Everything we know about what he said and what he did was written within 15 to 60 years of Christ's death, written by those who come from the same area. When you look at Islam, everything we know about Muhammad comes from two to 300 years later, hundreds of miles of the way. Which do you think is the more authoritative? Bingo. When you do a comparison, thank God we have the gospel accounts and we have Paul's letters. In fact, as a comparison, if we had to depend on sources for Jesus, comparable to what Muslims are dependent on for Muhammad, Jesus would not begin to appear until the third century. We would know nothing about Jesus until the third century. Nothing. How would we defend him? We wouldn't be able to defend him. Now, I just got done telling you that the Sirah of Muhammad is written by a man named Ibn Isham, and there is the Sirah right there, translated by Alfred Guillaum. But it says, Sirah to Rasulullah, written by Ibn Ishaq. Even there on the cover, it says Ibn Ishaq. But when you open up the introduction, it says very clearly that Ibn Ishaq had nothing to do with this. It was all written by Ibn Isham. That's 9th century, right? That's 833, right? 200 years after the fact. Muhammad died in 632. This is 833. This is 200 years later. Did I not say that just 10 minutes ago? I lied. This was not written by Ibn Ishaq. This was not even written by Ibn Isham. So who wrote this? We have nothing written by Ibn Isham. There probably was never an Ibn Isham. So then where does this come from? You can get it at any store. This is what I had to read when I was going through seminary. This is a book that everybody has to read to know who Muhammad was and what he did. That book, the Sirah to Rasulullah, comes from this gentleman right here. His name was Heinrich Friedrich Wustenfeld, who between 1858 and 1860, a German scholar in Arabic, went to four different German cities, went to all the libraries in those cities, and gleaned all the fragments he could find about this man named Muhammad, put it together into one form, and then published it in 1860. Folk, that's 160 years ago. There was nothing before the 1800s about, about Muhammad at all. Ooh, do, 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 do. So this is not Ibn Hisham from the 9th century. This is Wustenfeld from the 19th century, a thousand years later. Oh, don't stop there. I've been lying to you for the last 10 minutes. What about the other ones? The man who Muslims are dependent on to know who their prophet is or what he did is an elderly German linguist who wrote Muhammad's story 160 years ago, thus over 1,000 years too late. But folks, what about the other ones I've been talking about? You think the Siddha is bad enough? What about the other traditions that I put up there on the screen? So where are their extant manuscripts? Where is the first manuscripts for Sahih Muslim, for Al-Buhari, Tirmidhi, Ibn Daud? Where are they? Al-Tabari, all these guys that I've been putting up on the screen, we don't have any, uh, any manuscripts from them at all. None from the 9th century. But didn't I just say 9th and 10th century? Boy, did I not know what was going on. And this is yet to go up on YouTube. You're one of the first to hear this. We've now found the earliest extant manuscripts for all of these writers. And none of them are from the 9th and 10th century. So where are they from? Let's look at Ibn Daud, 10th century. That's 100 years later. Sahih Muslim, 11th century. That's 200 years later. Ibn Majah, 11th century, 200 years later. an Nasai, 12th century, 300 years later. Jami al-Tirmidhi, 13th century. That's 400 years. Sahih Bukhari, the most important of all of the Hadith traditions. The one that is Sahih means he is perfect, according to all Muslim, is from the 14th to the 15th century. That's 500 years later. You've never heard this before, have you? They have nothing before the 11th century and the, before the 10th century. Not a thing. And most of them come from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th century, folks. That is the Ottoman period. All redacted back to a man named Ibn, uh, back to Al-Buhari, back to someone named Ibn Hisham, back to someone named Al-Tabari. They're all redacted back. Well, what about the other traditions which supposedly come from the seventh century? These are the ones the Muslims claim to be the companions of the prophet himself. Let's see when they were written. 
companions of Muhammad, all from the seventh century, according to Islam, the Muatta comes straight from not Muhammad's time, comes from the ninth century. That's 200 years later. The Sahifa of Munabi, that comes from the 12th century. The Hanbal comes from the 13th century. So does the Musanaf of Abdul Razak from the 13th century. So does the Tadlisi from the 13th century. So what about Aimi Shaiba from the 13th century? Those are 600 years later. None of them are from the 7th century. See, this is yet to go up on YouTube. Even the world doesn't know about this yet. Because no one's dared to go back and ask this question. We're the first to do so. Conclusion, these documents were all supposedly created in the 7th to 9th century, yet they do not begin to appear until the 9th to 15th century, thus from 100 to 600 years too late. This suggests that they were all written by others hundreds of years later. Consequently, they are all redacted attributions. None of them probably are true. There was no Ibn Hisham or Al-Buhari or Sahih Muslim or Ibn Daud. None of these guys existed. We don't have anything written by them. We only have attributions. Much like we have in Christianity, the Gospel of Thomas. Did Thomas write the Gospel of Thomas? Absolutely not. That was written hundreds of years later. The Gospel of Barnabas. Did Barnabas write the Gospel of Barnabas? No, it was written in the 16th century, redacted to back to Barnabas. These are nothing more than frauds. But see, nobody's dared go public with this. We're going public. The world needs to hear this. Islam is, is sources of Islam are causing such a consternation that now the 21st century scholars are concerning, these are their conclusions, that Islam as we know it did not exist in the seventh century but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. The Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years as Muslims tell us, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Conclusion, the history of Islam at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik, that's 685 to 705 and before is a later fabrication. It's a fraud. There's no other way to say it. Now, that's the problem of the sources. Now let's get to Mecca. Because Mecca is absolutely important. Without Mecca, everything else comes crashing down. We've got to look and see what, uh, what's going on with Mecca. Why is Mecca so important? Because it still exists today, therefore it can still be researched today. But remember, Islam is dependent on three things. The book, the man, and the place. The book is the Quran, the man is Muhammad, and the place is Mecca. It's just like a stool with three legs. If you start to attack one of the legs and it begins to wobble, the other two begin to wobble as well. If you shut down Mecca and destroy the leg of Mecca, then the other come cascading around. Because it doesn't matter what Muhammad you find, it's not the Muhammad from Mecca. It doesn't matter what Quran you find, it's not the Quran from Mecca. And if it's not the Quran from Mecca or Muhammad from Mecca, then where is it from? It's no longer Islamic. Can you see why we start with Mecca? You've got to shut down Mecca. So let's do that. If we eradicate Mecca, then there is no Islamic Muhammad nor an Islamic Quran. So let's begin by looking at what Muslims claim for Mecca, and this is what they claim. They claim that it's the oldest city in the history of mankind. It's where Adam and Eve were sent to. Remember as I said earlier, that Adam was thrown down to Sri Lanka, Eve was thrown down to Mecca. Whoever threw them down was not a good shot. Don't worry, Adam was big enough, tall enough, he was 90 meters tall, he went boom, 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 and all of there joined his wife in Mecca. So therefore, it is the earliest inhabitant for mankind because you can't get anything earlier than Mecca if that's where Adam and Eve are from because there's no people earlier than Adam and Eve. So therefore it's the earliest encampment for mankind. Number two, it's where Abraham lived according to chapter 21 of the Quran verse 51 to 71. Abraham was there rebuilding the Kaaba, so he, it must have existed in 1900 BC. It is where all the trade, north, south, east, and went, went through, according to the Islamic tradition. So it should be one of the best known and best documented places on, on the face of the earth. Now, I usually go through a whole hour just unpacking Mecca. We don't have time to do that because I see already we're coming up to seven o'clock. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you the conclusions of what we know about Mecca. You can go up on Fander Films and see what I do as I unpack it. That goes for two hours just on Mecca alone. When you look at Mecca, number four, conclusion number one, if it did not exist, then neither did Muhammad or the Quran. Since it's foundational for both Muhammad and the Quran, without it, they both fall. It is important for Muslims because they believe that it is the earliest and most important city in the history of mankind, yet references to Mecca in the Quran and traditions do not hold up historically. The fact that it's near Sodom and Gomorrah, no, you know where Sodom and Gomorrah is, it's way up in Israel, that's 1,200 miles further north that Abraham, Ishmael, and Hagar lived there. If they lived there, then we're gonna to have to change the Bible because the Bible has them living in Iraq, then going up to Haran, then coming down to what is today Israel. Can you see why? You're gonna to have to change everything that we see in the Bible if this were the case. I have nobody anywhere that believes that Abraham actually lived in Mecca. 
If he lived in Mecca, then you've got to show me some evidence for that. More than that. Number two, the vegetation and peoples listed there are all 600 miles. If you look at the Quran, it's full of reference and reference to this great place that's full of vegetation. It has trees, it has clay, it has loam, it has grass, it has water. It has olive trees. Folks, anybody that knows anything about vegetation knows that olive trees are only grown around the Mediterranean. That's a thousand miles further north. You cannot have olive trees that far down. And as you're going to see, Mecca is the worst place for olive trees to grow. Ironically, though, it's claimed to be the greatest city in the history, the Quran itself only refers to it once. In chapter 48, verse 24, if it's the oldest city, the greatest city in history, why is it only referred to one time? Obviously, the Quran, which was written in the 8th and 9th century, still didn't know much about Mecca, even that late, signifying that the authors either did not consider it that important or it only came into existence much later on. Look at the geography, 65 geographical names that are listed in the Quran. When you look at that, it says that these people from Tambud, 24 times it refers to the people from Tambud, that this prophet doesn't name his name. Isn't it interesting? Muhammad's only named four times in the Quran. Yet he is having this relationship with these people from Tambud 24 times he relates to these people from Tambud. Tambud is Nabatea, folks. That's in Jordan. That's 600 miles to the, far, to the north. He's having these relationships. 23 times he goes and meets these people from Ud. That is the, the Uz, the, the city, the country of Uz, the people of Uz that is in the Bible. That's way up in Jordan. That's 600 miles to the north. Seven times he has this relationship with the people from Midian. You know where Midian is? It's just south of where the people from Ud and the people are the Nabataeans. Again, in southern Jordan. These people live 600 miles to the north. If he was having a relationship with them and he lived way down in Mecca, take a look where Mecca is. It's way down here. See Mecca way down here? There's Ad, there's Thambud, there's Midian. Way up here. Do you notice it? There's Mecca down here. Ad, Thambud, Midian. There's 600 miles. That means he'd have to go 600 miles up and 600 miles back in one day. 1,200 miles. You can't do that by camel. You can do that by helicopter. Airplane, yes. But they didn't have those in the 7th century. Not that I know of. So you can see whoever wrote the Quran did not live that far south. He lived way up there, up in the north. Ooh, you're going to love that. So geographically speaking, we saw we've got the wrong man. Now, let's continue on. The Quranic Arabic, as well as the supposed prophets, are all situated to the north. When you read the Quran, when you open it up and just read the Arabic, Look at the Arabic that's here. You can all read it. I know you can, so just read it with me. And what do you notice? There's an Alaf Maksura there. There's the Tar Marbuta there. You know there's a definite article, the L, right? All the way through the Quran. That is the wrong Arabic for Mecca and Medina. The Arabic that is used in Mecca and Medina is Sabaic Arabic, which is from Yemen. They don't have the Tar Marbuta. There is no Alaf Maksura. There is no definite article. This Arabic is from what is today Jordan, 600 miles to the north. Have I not said that already? All the geographical locations are up there, so is the Arabic. It's the wrong Arabic for that part of the world. Let's continue on. Mecca is where Muslims contend that between 70 to 300 prophets are buried. And when, you're, when you die, you are buried within 24 hours. If that is the case, they're all buried around the Kaaba, it says. And they're all buried in a kneeling position so they can be preserved and keep praying. If that is the case, they're still preserved today. Yet look at all of the all of the construction that's going on in Mecca today. When you look at Mecca today, look at all the, these towers, look at that big clock tower, the fourth highest building in the world. There it is right there, looking down onto the Kaaba. There's the Kaaba and there's the clock tower. The fourth highest building in the world. Look at all these cranes, look at all these buildings, 62 skyscrapers. When you build skyscrapers, you've gotta de dig deep foundations, do you not? And when you dig deep foundations, you come across artifacts, do you not? And the archeologists show up and they start licking their lips because that means you're gonna find all these artifacts that start to recreate the history of the city. We've asked the archeologists who live in Mecca, what have you found? And they look down at their shoes, not a thing. They've not found a thing there. Oh, they did find ruins from an Ottoman fort from the 13th century AD, not BC, but AD. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. That's only 700 years ago. Can you see why no one wants to talk about this? And that's why they're now building all these buildings to cement the whole case over. If you look here, they have now destroyed Khadija's house, the wife of Muhammad, they destroyed her house. They destroyed right there is where the Muhammad was born. There's Khadija's house. There's where Muhammad was born right there. They're destroying all these so that they're covering up with cement so no one can ask this question. You cover up the evidence with cement because they know there's nothing there 
absolute nothing there. They have to find 300 prophets, they can't even find one. When you then ask the surrounding nations, now Dr. Patricia Kurono was head of department at Oxford University. Uh, she wrote a book called Mech and Trade in the Rise of Islam. Now this woman reads and writes 15 archaic languages. She reads Akkadian, she reads Nabataean Aramaic, she reads Syro-Aramaic, she reads languages you've never even heard of before. She's one of the only ones in the world who can read these languages. Hugely, hugely important. And so she decided to go back to the original documents to ask where is this Mecca that you're all talking about? Which is a pretty important question to ask, isn't it? If it's the oldest city in history, it's where Abraham lived, it's where the center of trade, north, south, east, and west. So she went down to the southern part down here. She went to the Hadramat and she went to the Himyad. No one had heard about that. She read the original documents. See, she went to the Hadramat area. No one had heard about it. She went and asked the Persians. She went and asked the Romans. She went and asked the Assyrians. She went and asked of all these great empires. Not one word about Mecca in any of them. She went and asked the Nubians over here, and she went up in the Nabataeans. She went to all the surrounding nations, read all their original documents, and could not find one reference to Mecca in any of their documents. She wrote her book, Mecca and Trade and the Rise of Islam, in 1987, got death threats from Muslims there at Oxford University, had to move up to Cambridge, and that's where I got to meet her, and she helped me when I started my doctorate, my PhD. And I did my first debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi, and I used only her material. I went up to her office the week before the debate, up there in Cambridge, and I said, can you help me? I have 10 historical questions. So she looked at my 10 historical questions and says, here, don't say that, say this. Here's a better way to say it. Here, here's something you haven't thought of. After about three hours, I turned to her and says, why aren't you doing this debate? You're the world's leading authority on Mecca. You read and write 15 languages. I, don't even, I hardly even read and write three or four. And look at you have been able to find. You should do this debate. She looked at me and she started laughing. She said, Jay, I have a chair to protect. I have an institution to represent. I can't do this debate, but you, you have no chair to protect. And the only person you're responsible to is Jesus Christ. You have all the freedoms to this debate, but I don't. And she was absolutely correct. This is in 1995 she told me this. We as Christians can do something that even the historians can't do. Even the greatest scholars today cannot do this debate. It's too dangerous. They will be killed. But we don't care if we're killed. We have someone who protects us, and Patricia Crone knew that. She knew something that you all know as well. This is our material. This is our debate. We can do this like no one else can. But see what, how devastating this critique was. She went and one looked at all the other insignificant towns that were there around Mecca and said, well, listen, maybe these towns were not known about either. Maybe it's just because that part of the world was just not known. So she went to Aden. She went to Najran. She went to Taif. She went to Yathrib. She went to Khaybar. She went to Tabuk. She went to Petra. She went to Gaza. All these insignificant towns that are right surrounding Mecca up on the western plateau. And she found references to every one of them that go all the way back to 300 B.C. Every one of these towns was well known. Not one word about Mecca. What does that tell you? It just has no history. There's nothing historical about it. And the reason, when she looked at the trade routes, and she went and looked and tried to find the trade route, that's why she wrote the book. She noticed that all the trade routes, if you look and see, they're all on the western plateau. Look at this, this picture here. There you can see. There's Sana, there's Najran, there's Taif, there's Yathrib. Tabuk, Chaybar, there is Gaza. Notice they're all up on the western plateau. That's where the water is. Where's Mecca? You can see it's off the western plateau, 3,000 feet off. Why would you go down to a little hamlet that has no water if you have camels? No wonder, it's not on the trade route. That's why no one's heard of it. Up to 741 AD, no historian nor geographer had ever referred to the city. She went to look at Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy is the great geographer of the Arabia. He wrote his book in the second century AD, and he wrote all about Arabia. So she went to look at his book, and she went to look at the maps. She went map after map after map that recreated what Ptolemy had said, and what was made conspicuously missing on every one of these maps, what was conspicuously missing on his geography of Arabia was the city of Mecca. Not one reference to it. Proving as even as late as the second century AD, there was no reference to this city. Neither the land trade route along the Arabian plateau nor the Red Sea trade route along the eastern African coast supports an early Mecca, proving that none of the trade went via Mecca at all, confronting the notion that it was even the center of trade. And why? Here's the reason why no one has heard of it. Just two words, no water. 
Just look at that picture of Arabia. There's Mecca and Medina. See it there? Mecca and Medina, right in the middle. It's in the middle of a desert. If there's a desert, there's no water. No water, no food. No food, no people. No people, no towns. No towns, no city. No cities, no history. No civilization at all. How long did it take me to say that? Five seconds. That's all you need to say. If there's no water, there's no food. There's no food there, no people. No people, no towns. No towns, no cities. No cities, no history. No civilization. No wonder no one's ever heard of Mecca. It's in the wrong place. You can't have a history without water. And that's why everything we're finding in the Quran, in all the traditions, is way up north. Why? Because that's where the water is. Mesopotamia, the land of the two rivers. Everything is up in the north, 600 to 1,000 miles further north, or down in the south, because that's where the water is. Despite Muslims claim that they had the Zamzam well, and therefore the Zamzam well gave them all the water they need, and it's there today. You can see it right next to the Kaaba, 30 feet away from the Kaaba. The Zamzam well not only outfits all the people in the world, 1.9 billion people can drink Zamzam water. You go to any Muslim bookstore, and you can see Zamzam water in liter jars, all from that little well. Four million people come and do the Hajj every year, and they all drink Zamzam water from a well that's only 30 feet across and 50 feet deep. Where do you think the water comes from that Zamzam well? Well, just, take, just go up on Wikipedia and find out. I did a whole research on this. You can find it out yourself. Wikipedia exposes it to you. See, it does not come from Allah, like the Muslims say. They say it all comes from Allah, that Allah keeps the water there. No, it doesn't. It has pipes going into it, pipes coming out of it. Just follow the pipes. They go up to these big holding tanks, 11 of the largest tanks in the world, right up there in Mecca, 11 of them holding this water, putting in perfume into the water, and follow where those pipes come from, because you want to see where, where they get the water from the holding tanks? Just follow the water it goes down to Jeddah and it goes down to these desalination plants that you see right there 27 of these desalination plants none of it comes from all of them made by Bechtel Corporation Kansas City United States <laughs> we supply the water this has nothing to do with Islam it doesn't even have anything to do with Allah thank God for America because of Mecca's water problem, Queen Zubaydah had, had built an aqueduct in 8001. They had such a problem that even as early as the 9th century, they had to build an aqueduct to support the water. Now, what about the Hajj? When you get to the Hajj, you notice what Muslims do. Well, the first thing they do is they circumambulate that square building there. That's called the Kaaba. What does Kaaba mean? Well, it's in Hebrew as well. It means cube. That's what it means. In Arabic, in Aramaic, in Syriac, and also in Hebrew, it's the same word. They all come from the same root. Well, where do you think the original cube is? In order to find the original cube, you need to go to Jerusalem. That's where the first cube is. That is where the Holy of Holies is called the Kaaba in Hebrew. And what did the Jews do whenever they came on pilgrimage to Jerusalem? They circumambulated seven times going counterclockwise, right? Isn't that exactly what the Muslims are doing? Circumambulating seven climbs counterclockwise. No Muslim knows why they're doing that. I'll tell you why they're doing it. They're just copying the Jews. It was in Jerusalem. After they circumambulate seven times, what do they then do? They then run back and forth between these two mountains, Safa and Marwa, right there, seven times. Seven? Why number seven? That's the perfect number in Hebrew, right? But notice Safa and Marwa, are those mountains? There's a picture of it. There's another one. Are those mountains? No, they're just rocks, 20 feet high. Children can climb on those. That's Safa or that's Marwa. Obviously, these are not the original Safa and Marwa. This is not where Hagar went to look for water, between the two mountains to look for water. When she finally comes back where Ishmael is, there's the water coming out of the ground. And she says, stop, stop, zum, zum. That's why it's called zum, zum, well. Stop, stop. To understand where those come from, where those are originated. Those are not the originals. Those are nothing more than facsimiles. Possibly they came from Petra, but the real place they come from is Mount Scopus and Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where the Temple Mount is. That's where the Kaaba, the original Kaaba was. That's where the Jewish pilgrims would come and circumambulate seven times going counterclockwise. Then they go down to the Kidron Valley, come back to Mount Scopus. Those really are mountains. They're still there today. What is the Arabic word for Scopus Safa? What is the Arabic word for Moriah? Marwa. Marwa and Safa are Mount Moriah and Mount Scopus, Jerusalem. They've just taken what was originally there, brought it down to Mecca, and made nothing more than facsimiles of what was the real mountain. You've got to go to Jerusalem. Everything comes back to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? All the different practices they do comes from Jerusalem. 
No mosques had a Qibla. When Dan Gibson, he went to 100 mosques in the 7th and 8th century, looking at all the mosques as far away as China, as far away as in Kerala. He went to Turkey, he went down to Syria, he went to Africa, he went to India, trying to find the earliest mosques from the 7th and 8th century. And he knows that all the Qiblas, that means the direction of every mosque, the Qibla wall, where they're all directed to, was towards what he thought was Petra. Not one was towards Mecca. Not one. Not until 715, the 8th century. Nothing was towards Mecca. And then in 715, suddenly the mosques start to face Mecca. That's 100 years too late. By 856, then all of them were, face, were facing Mecca. But that's 200 years too late. The antecedents for Mecca pilgrimage makes more sense with Jerusalem than they do for Petra or for Mecca as they are not only earlier, but they are, are, have many more functional uses. Conclusion, certainly someone somewhere at some time should have known about the city, yet no one anywhere nor at any time has, proving that it never existed at the time of Muhammad nor during early Islam. If Mecca did not exist, then where did both Muhammad and the Quran come from? That's next. Now we get into really the real hard stuff. This is the stuff that gets Muslims really angry and they will not debate me on this. And you'll see why. So what about Muhammad? We need to find Muhammad, right, in the seventh century. Have I not gone done saying that he didn't exist? How dare I say that? Well, let's see if I'm correct. What do they claim? They claim the Muhammad of Islam was the last and greatest prophet who lived in Mecca between 570 and 6 to 632 AD and that he died in Medina in 632. He moved, he modeled Islam as the paradigm for the world. He received the Quran as the final revelation for the world. Everything we need to know about him we can find in the Sira of Ibn Isham 833. But did I say, notice that it's not 833, it's actually 1860? And that the Hadith of Al-Buhari is from 870, but I did not tell you that it's not from 870, it's actually from the 12th to the 16th century. Three to eight, 600 years too late. Unfortunately, these references are all in the 9th to the 19th century, two to 1200 years after the fact. So is this Muhammad of Islam referred to in the 7th century or in the place he lived, the Hijaz, or doing the things he is supported to have done? That's the question we're asking. Before finding out, we need to deal first with the name Muhammad. Remember, the word Muhammad is Muhammad, right? How many vowels are in Muhammad? Three, ooh-ah-ah, right? Ooh-ah-ah. You'll see why that's significant. Let's go to the next slide. So what's in our name? Is it Muhammad or is it Muhammad? In the seventh century in Arabic, there were no vowels. No vowels existed, that was too early. You can see on earlier, I'll show you, in fact, just hold on a minute. There were no vowels at that time and there were no dots either, so you could not know what letters you were looking at. So therefore, in the seventh century, if there was any written reference to Muhammad, it would not be Muhammad, it would be Mahmud. Because of the fact that those vowels and the dots did not exist. There were only 16 consonants in the seventh century because it was taken from Aramaic, which is taken from Syriac, which is taken from Hebrew. The vowels were only created and added in the 8th and 9th century. So take a look at this manuscript here. These are four manuscripts. These are four manuscripts of the four of the six earliest manuscripts. There is the Ma'il manuscript you see there, and the Samarkand, and the Patropolitanus, and the Sana. Notice, there are no dots and no vowels on any of those. You can all see that, right? You can all read it, right? Try to read it. Can you read it? Any Arab speakers here or Arab readers here? Anybody? Okay, can you read it? Too small, I know that. But even if you could read it, if you get close to it, you could read it as well, right? Because it needs five dots and three vowels, right? And there's no dots on any of those. Look at, there's no dots there, there's no dots, any of these. These have no dots, no vowels, and these are the earliest manuscripts. But these manuscripts are all eighth century manuscripts. Now, one of these is from the seventh century. These are the earliest manuscripts. They only begin to appear in the eighth century. This is the best one, the top copy manuscript. And you can see some dots are beginning to show. They're starting to introduce dots. This is the mid 8th century, but they're not the dots we use today. And there's still no vowels there. Vowels have yet to be invented. So why is that important? Well, what does the word Muhammad look like today? That's what it looks like today. Muhammad. Mim ha mim dal. Four letters. With Adama and a Fatah and a Fatah, going from right to left. That little curly Q is Adama, that's U. The two slashes are 
I told you you're not going to have to learn Arabic. So you're not going to have to learn Arabic. Forgive me, this is the only Arabic you're going to have to see. But all I want you to notice is those are those, the three vowels. Can you see the little curly Q and the two slashes? All right? That's what it looks like today. But these vowels did not exist in the 7th century. They were introduced in the 8th and 9th century. Therefore, this is what it would have looked like in the 7th century. Mim, ha, mim, dal. There's the mim, there's the ha, there's the mim, and there's the dal. M-H-M-D in English, all right? Four letters. So how would you pronounce this word? Without the vowels, how would you pronounce it? Mahmud. That's how you would pronounce it. Mahmud. Well, hold on a minute. We should be looking for Mahmud, therefore and not Muhammad. And that's where the problem is. Everybody's been looking for Muhammad. Forget about Muhammad. We need to learn for Muhammad. Muhammad is what we need to, because that's the word that existed in the seventh century. Now, Muhammad, suddenly everything starts to make clear. What does Muhammad mean? Muhammad is well known. Muhammad is in Hebrew, it's in Aramaic, it's in Syriac, it's in Ugaritic, it's also in Arabic. Muhammad is not a name. It means the praised one. It means the blessed one. It means the anointed one. It also means the Messiah, the Muhammad that everybody's still waiting for. Thus, it became a title. It was not a name, it was a title. It was first used in Ugaritic in 1400 BC. Then it was used in Hebrew in 1000 BC and is found in the Bible 11 times in the Old Testament. The most exciting place is Song of Solomon 516. The altogether lovely one that Solomon's talking about, that Muslims have claimed, this is Muhammad. And I say, yes, it is, but it's not Muhammad, it's Muhammad. Get the writing correct, read it correctly. Who says it has a... Adama, Fatan, Fatan. There is no Arabic that early. Not in 1000 BC. It has yet to be invented. Arabic was only created about the 4th century AD. You've got to go to the Hebrew. Now here's what's interesting. Every Hebrew scholar knows that the Mahmud that's referred to, the altogether lovely one, is known as the anointed one. Subsequently, St. Ambrose noting what the Hebrews were noticing, said this is the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for. Well, we know who the Messiah was. The Messiah is Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him again, a second time. They're waiting for him the first time. Therefore, in the fourth century, he said the Mahmud, this is in Arabic, that's also in Aramaic, that's also in Syro-Aramaic, that Mahmud is Jesus Christ. So from the fourth century on, every time you see Mahmud in Arabic, it is referring to Jesus Christ as the Messiah who is yet to come. Are you starting to see the picture? So when, by the time you get to the seventh century, well, let's start with the sixth century. The Jews in 523 created an inscription with this title on it, and it puts it before any one of the exilarchs. The exilarchs are the Jews who are in the diaspora. They were there in what is today Iraq, in just south of what is today Baghdad, in the city of Hira, what is today Kufa. That is where the seminaries were, the Jewish seminaries. And any one of those who was in response for those seminaries was known as an exilarch. But before their name, they would put the title, the Mahmud, the Messiah ben Huziel, the Messiah ben Salman. Five exilarchs in the seventh century referred to themselves as the Messiah thinking they were the Messiah who's to come. When they died, the next one took on that title. That title was well known in Judaism. That title was well known in Christianity by the seventh century. Therefore, we should expect it all over the place and we see it everywhere. Not Muhammad, but Muhammad. So by the seventh century, the Christians use Muhammad to refer to the returning Messiah, while the Jews use Muhammad to refer to the Messiah yet to come, used with all the five exilarchs. Conclusion, the Muhammad was well known in that part of the world and at that time, but it was not pronounced as Muhammad. That is how we pronounce it today. And there lies the confusion. And I want you to look at this coin. I'm gonna show you this coin later on. That coin underlines everything. There is Mimha Mimdal. Do you see it there? Can you see the Mimha Mimdal, the four letters? There's no vowels above it. This, is writ, this was coined in 663 by Mu'awiyah, the caliph who controlled in Damascus and started the Umayyad Caliphate. He is well known as a Muslim, right? Every Muslim knows he was a Muslim, right? Well, there's his image right there. There's Mu'awiyah. What's he have in his hand? What's he have above his head? What's he have on the backside of the coin? Cross, cross, cross. How can it be a Muslim if he has a cross? Who are the ones who have crosses? Christians. He was not a Muslim, he was a Christian. Just look at the coin. Look at the evidence, folks. Coins don't lie. I've got this coin. I'm buying up all these coins. 
Because when the Muslims find out what we found out, they're going to buy them up and melt them down. We've got to buy these coins, folks. If you have any money, get these coins. We'll get to the coins later on. But I just want to get that so you what, what's going on. Knowing that, let's now look at the coins. Oh, we're going to get into the coins. So let's go right into the coins and let's see what's going on. Because you need to go to the coins. The coins are great. <clears throat> Whenever a king or a caliph or anybody who is responsible comes to power, they don't have radio, they didn't have television, they don't have the internet back then. So what is the first thing they do? They mint coins. Why? Because you put your name on the coin, you put your image on the coin, you put where the mint is, where the mint is from, and then you put the date. But most importantly, you put your theological or your religious denomination. So you always, if you're a Christian, you put a cross. If you're Zoroastrian, you put a fire altar. There were no pagans. We've just found that out in the last two months. We can't find any pagans at all in the seventh century in that part of the world. This whole thing with Jahaliya that the Muslims have been telling us, this period of ignorance. Jahaliya is the wrong word. It's there in Arabic, but it does not mean pagans. It means those you who are an unbeliever before you become a Christian, you're a Jahaliya, you are in ignorance. It's to do with people, not a whole group of individuals. And that's just come to light in the last two months. See how this is grits getting better and better as we go along? Yet Muslims tell us Jahiliyyah were the people that came before Muhammad. They were the people of ignorance. No, it's every Muslim was a Jahiliyyah. But here's what's interesting. We can't find any document, any reference to any people called Muslims in the seventh century. We can't find any document or any reference to any religion called Islam in the seventh century. Guess when they first get introduced? 945, that's the 10th century. Ooh, tu -tu -tu -tu. You're the first to hear it. And that's coming from the German scholars. The German scholars are starting to feed us this new material. The German scholars have known about this for over 100 years. Since 1920, they knew about this. The German scholars are way ahead of the rest of the world because they're all linguists. And they've been keeping it, catching it, do not, not wanting to get it into English. And finally, we've got the German scholars who are now feeding us this new material. And I won't tell you what his name is, but he is considered one of the top German scholars today. He knows 10 languages. He has chairs on two different institutions, one in Brussels, one in Germany. He teaches in Germany. He's a chair, he has a chair a professor in Germany. He's also a chair professor in German. He's also a chair professor in Brussels where he teaches only in French. And folks, what he is now telling me from all his scholars, the best scholars in the world, this is all brand new, so you're one of the first to hear about it. Can you see how this is just destroying what we now see? But look at the coins. In the seventh century and earlier, a ruler introduced the coins to announce who he was, what religion he belonged to, and where the coin was minted. Oddly around, when you look at all the mints, take a look where all the mints are. They're way up here in the north, and they're way over in the east. Notice that? They should be down here because if Islam was the center of the power, if that's where the political power was, if that's where the, that's where the caliph was living, then of course the mint should be where he is. Am I correct? There's not one mint that far south. And why do you think there are no mints in Mecca and Medina? One word. Water. You have to have water. In order to have mints, you have to have people who use the coins. The people have to feed. They have to have food, right? They have to live. In order to have food, you need to have water. Bingo, it's as simple as that. Anytime Muslims ask you this, why are there no mints there? Because of one word, there's no water. No water, no people. No people, no towns. No towns, no cities. No cities, no civilization. No civilization, no hintry, and no coins. They're all up in the north. They're all up in what is today Syria and Jordan and in Lebanon, and they're all over in what is today Iraq and Iran. That's where the mints are. Surprise, surprise. Why are they up there? Because there's water up there. That's where the Tigris and Euphrates are. That's where all the vertiture is. Yet according to every Islamic tradition, the center of Islam, therefore, where all the caliphs ruled, was from Mecca and Medina. Most troubling, none of the coins from 630 to 661 have any reference to a man named Muhammad, any reference to anybody called Abu Bakr, no, reference, no coins to a man named Umar or Uthman or Ali. If these were caliphs, why aren't they minting their own coins? Not one coin with their names on it. Oh, there are lots of coins written in Arabic, but they don't have those names on them. And every one of those coins are all from what is today Jordan and Syria and Iraq, all up in the north. Can you see how devastating this is? Now put yourself in a Muslim's shoes. How would you defend this? Where's your evidence, Muslims? You've got to have coins that show who your men are. 
Finally, with the reign of Mu'awiyah, he comes to power. He's the first one to create an entire empire, and he creates it there in Damascus. If he was a Muslim, why isn't he way down in Medina? What's he doing way up in Damascus, which is 1,200 miles further north? He's up there in Damascus, and he mints his own coins. Now, these are my coins. You're looking at my coins. Take a look at that. There's Mu'awiyah right there. What does he have in his hand? A cross, a cross, a cross. On the backside, another cross. It's obvious he's a Christian. He's a monophysite Christian. He's a Chalcedonian Christian. He's a Trinitarian Christian. Very clear when you look at the coins. Now, one coin he mentioned, 663, that I showed earlier, even has the name Mimha Mimdal on it. There's the Mimha Mimdal at the bottom. There it is. So who do you think that Mimha Mimdal is? The Mahmud. Who is the Mahmud? The Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Jesus. He's announcing the name of Jesus on that coin. Let's see if this is correct. Let's continue on. How can there be the name Muhammad on a coin with crosses? It was Muhammad and thus had to be Jesus due to the crosses on the front. Note, these coins suggest that all of the Umayyads were Christians. If you have any doubt that they were Christians, take a look. Here's a inscription that was created by Mu'awiyah. <clears throat> now, here's what's interesting. Mu'awiyah comes to power in 661. He's living in Damascus and he continues for 20 years up to 680. He is there, but look what he's writing in. He's writing in Greek. Why would he be writing in Greek if he was an Arab? He should be an Arab, therefore he should be writing in Arabic. Because the, Greeks, the Greek was the lingua franca of the seminaries. It was the lingua franca for the theology of that time. That's why he's writing in Greek. And what does he write? There's his name, Mu'uwiya. What does he say? Mu'uwiya, Abdullah, the slave of God. So he's referring, he's writing in Arabic, though the script is Greek, and he's saying himself as the servant of God. Name of God, Allah, is used by all the religions of that time. The Christians call God Allah. The Jews call God Allah. The Zoroastrians call God Allah, just like they do today in, in Christianity. That's the generic name for Allah. It's just the same thing that we would call, I'm sorry, for God, just like we'd say G-O-D in English. All right, so that's why it makes sense. But look what he says next. Abdullah Amir al-Mu'minin, which means the, serve, the commander of the believers. What believers is he referring to? Just look at the inscription. Boing, boing, boing. There's a cross. So obviously the believers are Christian. He's a Christian. For heaven's sakes, just read the inscription. And if you're not going to call out, let the rocks cry out for you. Let the coins cry out for you. And the great thing about rock inscriptions and coins, they don't deteriorate, they don't disintegrate. They're as good today as the day they were minted and the day they were chiseled. That's why I love rocks and coins. Isn't that great? See, God knew that we were gonna get into this, this, this controversy in the 21st century. God made sure those coins were there. He made sure those rock inscriptions are there so that we don't even have to ask the question, we just show the evidence. And who do you think has all the evidence? We do. We do. Now, let's continue on. Now we get into one of my favorite guys named Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik was the greatest of the Umayyad caliphs. He was there in Damascus again. Interesting, he's up in Damascus. He should be down in Medina if he's a Muslim, but he's not a Muslim. Nowhere does he call himself a Muslim. Nowhere does he say that he's a Muslim. But notice what he is. He, by that time, he controls from Spain in the west all the way to India in the east, from Turkey in the north all the way to Yemen in the south. So he has the second biggest superpower of the day. The only uh, country, the only power that's greater than him is the Byzantines, who are Christians. But they are Trinitarian Christians. They're monophysite Christians. So what does he do? He has to pay tribute to them. And so he has to pay, there's a picture of a coin. That's a, a Byzantine coin. There is Heraclius with his two sons on either side. If you look carefully, you can see they have an orb with a cross on it. So they're definitely Christians. On the back side of the coin is the Byzantine cross. So the Umayyads were obliged to pay the tribute to the Byzantine using these gold solidices. Then in 691, he mints this coin, 691. He has Heraclius with his two sons, but notice what he's done with the orbs. He's taken the cross off. This is a mockery of Byzantine Christianity. And on the backside, he's taken the cross piece off. You notice that? He's taken the, the crosses off the orbs and he's taken the cross piece off. So now this is a mockery. He pays tribute with these coins in 691. Justinian II, who is the, who is the Byzantine emperor, goes to war with him, loses the battle. Abdul Malik wins the battle and immediately introduces this coin. 
This is the coin he introduces. There is his image there with him holding a sword. This is a victory coin saying that I have won the battle. But notice what he writes in Arabic around the outside. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Where's my Arab speaker? Oh, he was sitting right over here. Went to the toilet. Okay, what does la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah mean? There is only one God but God. And Muhammad, the praised one, is the servant of God, right? Just say yes. <laughs> like this morning. Isn't that nice? I can just ask him what to do. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur or Muhammad. There's no Muhammad in there. Do you see any vowels in that inscription? There's no Dhamma, there's no Fatta. There were no Dhammas and Fattas in the seventh century. Therefore, why are we reading Muhammad in that? We need to read what's written. It's Muhammad. Who is he? Rasulullah. He is the servant of God. He introduces that onto the coins. That is the first time we see the Shahada. Show me the Shahada in this book here, the Quran. There is no Shahada. There is no complete Shahada in this book at all. The Quran does not have the Shahada. It's introduced by Abdul Malik. He's attacking Byzantine Christianity. He's attacking for there is no God. But read the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock. The same year that he ring, introduces that coin, he also builds the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Look at the inner ambulatories, the two inner ambulatories, and look at the inscriptions written about. That's the only original part of the building. That building has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. Go to the original ambulatories and read the inscriptions that are around there. And they can say, say not three, for God is one and he has no son. Who is that attacking? Say not three, that's attacking the Trinity. For God is one, that's attacking Jesus' divinity, and he has no son, that's attacking his sonship. It's all an attack against Jesus. For truly, God is not begotten, nor is he begotten. No, God does not beget, nor is he begotten. That's again attacking his sonship. And then it has La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Then it has the Shahada. For this, for God is one, folks. And the Muhammad, the Messiah, the anointed one, is nothing more than the servant of God. He is not God, he is not part of the Trinity. This is an anti-Trinitarian attack against the Byzantine Trinitarian. This is a, basically an Aryan attack. Listen, this is nothing new, folks. This has been going on since the fourth century. Arian, who's attacking the, the church at that time. Why do you think we had the Council of Nicaea? Athanasius, what was he arguing against? He was arguing against Arianism in the fourth century. We're now in the seventh century. It raises its head again. But this time, not by a bishop, this time by a caliph. This by time by someone who's much more important. So this is not a nobody. This is the man that controls all the land from Spain to India, from Turkey to Yemen. This is a man with huge amount of responsibility, enormous amount of authority. So when he puts the Dome of the Rock, the greatest building of its day in that time, the greatest structure of its day, built right there where the Holy Mount is, where the Messiah is to come again. Everybody's waiting for the Messiah to come to Mount Moriah. The Jews are waiting, the Christians are waiting for him to come a second time. He goes into Jerusalem and he builds it right there. He's living in Damascus. Why doesn't he build it in Damascus? This is a polemic against Christian Byzantine Christianity. Why? Because his greatest threat are the Christian Byzantines. So this is a political statement and this is a theological statement simultaneously on that building and on this coin. Now, this is in 693. Then in 696, he introduces this coin. That's my coin. I finally bought it. It cost me $1,500 to buy that coin. If you can find some, give me, give me some money. We could use, buy those coins. That's a gold solar disc. And notice there is the Shahada there. There is the attacks against his divinity, against the Trinity. There you can see. And then it talks about that there is only one God but God. But then he says, for, there, for we will destroy those who are uh, uh, associators, those who associate any with God. Who do you think that's attacking? That's attacking us. The Mushrikuns. The Mushrikuns. We are the mushrikuns. The mushrikuns are anybody that elevates and commits shirk, elevates another to God. We are the mushrikuns because of what they feel we have done with Jesus Christ, elevated him to his divinity. That's all attack against Christianity. Folks, this is not Islam yet. There's nothing Islamic about this. This is an anti-Trinitarian attack against the Trinitarians. This is an internecine battle between Christians, which is still happening today. Who do you think the Jehovah Witnesses are? They could have created that coin. That is their coin as much as is Abdul Malik's. That tack is still happening even today. So why are we surprised that it happened this seventh century? 
Conclusion, these all suggest that there was an internecine clash between different sects within Christianity, the Trinitarians versus the anti-Trinitarians, with the latter establishing its own religion at the end of the Umayyad dynasty, not now because Islam had not begun this early, in opposition to Christianity mid 8th century, which then morphed into the Islam of today during the initial 100 to 200 years of the Abbasid dynasty in the 9th and 10th century. Now, if you want to look at the coins, you need to also look at the rock inscriptions. They do not disintegrate, they do not uh, deteriorate, and that's why they're so amazing. Note where the rock inscriptions are. They're all up here in the north, and they're all up here in the south. Those are from the 9th and 10th century. These are the 7th century. Notice, why are the rock inscriptions in the north, and why are they in the south? Because there's water. It's as simple as that. See, it all comes back to water. Do you see why everything comes back to water? And that's why you can shut down every discussion, every debate, just by saying one word, or two words, no water. That's why all the rock inscriptions are in those two areas. When you look at the rock inscriptions, the man who's done the best work is called Ilka Lindstedt. He's looked at 30 to 40,000 of these rock inscriptions, and he's looked at them primarily between 640 and 740. So he wanted to look at the Umayyad period. This is immediately after Muhammad's death, if Muhammad had been living, if there had been any. But he wanted to see if they even referenced a person named Muhammad. No reference whatsoever in any of these rock inscriptions to anybody named Muhammad at all or Abu Bakr, or Umar, or Uthman, or Ali, none of the caliphs, which shows you that even the evidence from the rock inscriptions support what the coins are telling us. In prior to 690, he noticed that all there was evidence of anything, there's nothing of whatsoever of Islamic on any inscriptions, except for former, everything comes after 690. From 690 to 710, the, the name Muhammad starts to appear. Not Muhammad, but Muhammad. From 710 to 720, Muslim rites begin to appear, such as the pilgrimage and the prayers and the fasts. And then from 720 to 730, the names Muslim and Islam refer to a specific group, but we're now finding, and I'm going to have to change that because now we've just found from the Germans, the first reference to Muslims and Islam do not begin to appear until the 10th century. But this is in contradistinction to Christianity. However, new research suggests that these names, oh, there they have it right there. These names do not appear until 945 AD. Conclusion, it was only in the 730s, we're well into the 8th century now and onwards, that there is evidence of popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and a messenger, which makes the Islamic traditions incredibly awkward. Furthermore, there is a hundred year silence prior to this that indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which cast doubt on whether he had any part in starting him. But the name Muhammad does occur in other texts in the seventh century, at least purported to be the seventh century. So let's now look at them. Look at the Quran itself. Now, I don't believe this, by the way, folks. I don't believe any of these Qurans are seventh century. Why? Well, wait till we get to the Quran, you'll see why. But nonetheless, Muslims claim they're from the seventh century. When you look at the Quran internally, you notice there are only four references to Muhammad, not Muhammad, but Muhammad on the earliest manuscripts. Fascinating, Moses is found 136 times, Jesus is found 93 times, Abraham is found 79 times, Pharaoh is found 74 times, suggesting that Muhammad was not very popular. And when you look at those four times, there it is in chapter 3, verse 144, in chapter 33, verse 40, in chapter 47, verse 2, and in chapter 48, verse 29. In every case, in every case, this is Jesus Christ. This Muhammad is the Messiah. Just read the references. You can see when you take the vowels out and go back to Mahmud, it is the Mahmud that we should expect to find in the 7th and 8th century. None of them refer to a person called Muhammad who lived in the Hijaz in Arabia, but the Mahmud. They all refer to the Mahmud. They most likely refer instead to the blessed one or the anointed one or the praised one, as we have noted. It's a title. That is the word Mahmud means. And who could very well therefore be Jesus Christ? If this is not the prophet from Mecca at all, then Muslims cannot use the Quran to support Muhammad, the prophet's existence in the seventh century. And one of the foundations of Islam begins to fall. Well, what about the Dome of the Rock? I've talked about the Dogamat earlier, and you've heard me say that. There's the Dome of the Rock. Notice where the two arrow green arrows are. That, that, that's the inner ambulatory. That's the only original part of the dome. It has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. That's the only part that was actually created in 691. And that's where the inscriptions are. And when you read the inscriptions, they're all attacks against Jesus Christ. That's where the Shahada first begins to appear. And that is all referring that the praise one is not, 
is nothing more than the messenger of God, the blessed one, who could be Jesus. The Quranic verses in these inscriptions are not the same as that which we have in the Quran today, though they're copied into the Quran later on, and are thus possibly precursors to the Quranic verses which were written later and then changed to refer to the prophet himself. Conclusion, if correct, then Muslims cannot use the Dome of the Rock to support Muhammad's existence in the seventh century either, and another foundational pillar of Islam begins to fall even further. Now hold on a minute. Muslims will come back and say yes, but there are lots of references to this Muhammad, this Muhammad in the seventh century. So let's look at them. No, there are not. The many that they come up with have no reference to Muhammad in any of them. There are only five that have the word Muhammad in them. Not Muhammad, but Muhammad. Why? Because there's no vowels that early. So when you hear that, Muslims are imposing that onto the text and they don't realize that Arabic does not accommodate Muhammad, not that early. So let's look at those five. Thomas the Presbyter in 634, writing, he talks about a battle between the Romans and the Tayyaye du Muhammad. Now notice, it's Muhammad with a T. This is the Persian smelling for the praise one. And he refers to that it's in Gaza. This is a Pahlavi, the Tayyaye. They are the Lachmans that are in what is today northern Iraq, in of what is today Mosul in Tikrit, fighting in Gaza, way over to the west. So therefore, this cannot be the Muhammad of Islam because he's way up to the north and way too far to the west. He's over 1,000 to 1,200 miles too far to the north. It cannot be the Muhammad or of, of Islam. 636, you have a flyleaf which talks about the Arabs of Muhammad killed many Syrians in Yarmouk in Gabatha. Look where Yarmouk is. That's way up in Jordan in Syria. Muhammad never went to Yarmouk, way too far to the north, so it's another praised one. It's more likely reference to someone who used that title to aggrandize themselves. In 660, Sabaeus refers to an Ishmaelite called Muhammad who with 12,000 Israelites attacks the Byzantines. There is no record of any Arabs or less even 12,000 of them partnering with Jews any time in the seventh century, invading Byzantium in the seventh century. This is not only, his, and not, and only not historical, it's fraudulent from its very core. So we can throw that one out. The fourth one is probably a little better, 690. We're now at the end of the seventh century. By this time, the Dome of the Rock is well built. This is the time the Dome of the Rock is built. This is the time the coins are being introduced with the name Muhammad on it. And John of Barca talks about this Muhammad, this teacher, leader of the Arabs. This is the first real good reference, but still, he talks about him way up in the north, up in what is today Iraq. That's a thousand miles too far north. And then we get John of Damascus. Now, I love John of Damascus, because John of Damascus is right there in the court of Abdul Malik. He is there in Damascus. He is part of the courts of Abdul Malik. So he is watching it happen right there. He's an eyewitness to what is going on. He then retires in 730 and goes to a monastery and writes his most famous book. But look at the title of the book. The Heresy of the Ishmaelites. Why don't we read that title? Who are the Ishmaelites? The Ishmaelites are the Arabs, the Nabataean Arabs who are from Jordan. They are the ones that trace the lineage back to Abraham through Ishmael. The Jews and the Christians also go to Abraham through Isaac. The Ishmaelites are also known as Hagarin. And notice all these Arabs refer to themselves in five different words. There are five different words they use. They use Ishmaelites because they're in the line of Ishmael. They use Hagarin because they're in the line of Hagar. They use Magre, which means people of the Hagarins, people of Hagar. They use the, the words Mushri, um, um, not Mushrikun. Um, Muhajirun, the people who go on a hijad, people who go on an exodus, they're nomadic, they're always moving to place to place, and they name themselves, well, they don't name themselves, they're referred to as Sarasans. No reference to any people called Muslims. These are all people in the line of Ishmael, they're in the line of Hagar, and they're proud of their lineage. But here's the problem. They now control the Umayyad the Caliphate. They are now in Damascus. They control from Spain all the way to India, from Turkey all the way to Yemen. They are the superpower of the day. Only the Byzantines are greater. The Byzantines are Christians. The Jews are in charge of Jerusalem, but they control Jerusalem, right? And here's the difficulty. The Jews and the Christians have a prophetic line, right? Through Isaac. We know that prophetic line. We know exactly where all the prophets come from. The Jews and the Christians have a revelation, the Old and New Testament. The Ishmaelites have no prophetic line. There's no one after Ishmael. Who comes after Ishmael? Nobody. We don't know of anybody. 
The Jews, the Ishmaelites, and the Hagarines have no revelation. What revelation do they have? So now you are in charge of the holy place. You are in charge of Jerusalem. You control all this land. And right north of you is your greatest threat, the Christian Byzantines. So what do you do? You go and you build the Dome of the Rock right in the holy place of Jews and Christians. And what do you do? You write these inscriptions attacking Jesus, attacking his divinity, attacking the Trinity. You're an Ishmaelite. And what do you do next? You confront and look where the Dome of the Rock is built, right where the Temple Mount is, right where the Messiah, where the Mahmud is going to return. And it's above looking down on the Church of the Sepulchre where all the Christians come for pilgrimage. It's looking down on the Christians. It's looking down on the Jews. And now... You are an Ishmaelite. What do you do? You need to, therefore, create your own prophetic line. And if you're going to create a prophetic line, who do you think you're going to use? You're going to use the Mahmud. Because everybody's waiting for the Mahmud, right? The Jews are waiting for the Mahmud. They put that name before every one of their exilarchs. The Christians are waiting for the Mahmud to return a second time. So you say, we've got the Mahmud. But you put three vowels above his name. Muhammad. So here comes John of Damascus in 730, right? He comes and he writes this great reference. He writes about this and he says, here is this Mahmud that you're talking about. So he's, in, he's well into the eighth century now. And he, then he looks and says, this Mahmud has ludicrous doctrines. And then he starts naming them off. He talks about these books that this Mahmud has created. He refers to this book called the cow. That's now in chapter two of the Quran. He talks about the book called the women. That's in chapter four of the Quran. He talks about the book called the table. That's in chapter five of the Quran. And then he talks the book called the camel. That's, capital, that's chapter zero. There is no book called the camel in the Quran. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. But I thought there was only one Quran. I thought the Quran was complete by 730, but certainly by 652, right? We're in 730, we're well into the 8th century, and there are four different books, all of which then are taken and put into the Quran in chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, and then a chapter that doesn't even exist. This is not the Quran that we have today. Are you starting to see what's going on, folks? You have to have a prophet. Once you introduce this prophet, he has to have a book. Now you're starting to realize where we're going with all of this. Conclusion, every reference to Muhammad or Mahmud in the seventh century places him in Gaza or Jerusalem or Damascus or in Hira, which are all situated in Jordan and in Syria and in Iraq, all far to the north, and probably referred to another Mahmud, the praised one, probably Jesus Christ. Here are the conclusions. We won't go through them again. We've already done through. I just want to end with this one. These coins and inscriptions refer to the Christian and Jewish Mahmuds who are either the Messiah yet to come, that's the Jews, for the first time, or the Messiah yet to come a second time, that's the Christians. It is that Mahmud who is then appropriated by the seventh century Ishmaelite Arabs, the Umayyads, as their prophet Mahmud, who then is introduced as Muhammad by the eighth to ninth century Abbasids as the fulfillment of the other two. Now we're gonna get into the Quran. We're gonna end with this. You ready? Here we go. What about the Quran then? Once you got a man, once you got a prophet, you've got to have a book. You've got to create a book. So, what do the Muslims claim about their book? This is what the Muslims claim. The Quran is uncreated, that has always existed, it has never been created. It is the uncreated Quran. Why do we know that? Because of chapter 85 verse 22 says that. It's already internal to the Quran. They also say the Quran was sent down to a man named Muhammad between 610 and 632, that 22 year period. That the Quran was completed by Uthman in 652, that's mid 7th century. And that the Quran has unchanged in the last 1400 years. Not one word, not one letter has changed. Now look at those four letter words in blue. Uncreated, sent down, completed, unchanged. Can you remember those four words? Those are the four claims Muslims make about the Quran. Every Muslim, whether they are radical or nominal, may not the liberals, but the radicals and the nominals will all make those claims. 99% of all Muslims make those four claims about the Quran. Memorize those four words. We're going to come back to them. So why do they make these claims? Because folks don't blame them, they're in the Quran themselves. It's the Quran that makes those four claims. Eternality is found in chapter 85, verse 21 and 22. As far as not one word has been changed, that's in chapter 10, verse 15, and in chapter 18, verse 27. And the reason that none can change his words or his letters is because Allah himself guards it in chapter 15, verse nine. It says that, that Allah guards it, that's why no man can change what is eternal, what God has not created, because it's uncreated. So 
what is our remit tonight? Well, I cannot critique sent down or uncreated because I'm not there in the seventh century, but I can critique the second two. I can't critique number one and two, but I can critique three and four. Thus, what I would want to find from any Muslim that wants to engage me in a debate, they then have to provide for me one Quranic manuscript that's from the mid seventh century, not from one that's after, because they're the ones that claim it was finished by 652, that Uthman was the one that created the Quran and wrote it down in its written form. Therefore, it must be 114 surahs unchanged. It must look just like this Quran that I have in my hand today. Must be just like this, 114 surah, not one word, not one letter that's different, because that's their claim. Not my claim, that's their claim. Now, what do they say? This is what they say. According to what Al Buhari says, and he is the one that tells us how the Quran was put together. He said that Muhammad died in 632. The Quran had not yet been. Okay. It's just telling me about my flight. So, it says that if the Uthman. The Quran had not been written down when he died in 632. It was written down by the time of Uthman, the, the, what they call the Qurayshi Quran in 652. So that's the mid seventh century. Now, when he wrote that down and had it written down by Zaid ibn Tabid, his secretary, he then sent it to five cities. Those are the five cities you see up there. Let me get my clicker out here. And they are Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. There they are over here. Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. So two in what is today Arabia, two in what is today Iraq, and one in what is today Syria. Those were sent to those five cities to preserve them so that nobody would change them because they didn't want to be any changes. These were the original ones. Now here's what's interesting. According to the Islamic traditions, not me, according to the standard Islamic narrative, a new crown starts to appear in Damascus, now written by a man named Uba ibn Qab, and it has 116 surahs. So it has two more surahs than what the Quran has today. Then suddenly another one appears in uh, Baghdad, uh, written by Ibn Masud, and it has 110 surahs. That's four less than the Quran we have today. Then a third one appears in Basa, written by Ibn Musa. It has 114 surahs, but when you look at these three Qurans, when you look at the Islam Islamic traditions, when you look and see what they say about these Qurans, there are 15,000 differences between those three Qurans and the Quran I have in my hand right here. 15,000 differences. It's not me saying this, the Islamic traditions tell me this. So that's already within the seventh century, you're seeing huge amount of changes. But here's what I want to ask you. Where is Uba ibn Qab's Quran? Where is Ibn Masud's Quran? Where is Ibn Musa's Quran? Where are the five copies that were sent to those five cities? Show me one. Not one Quran exists today from the seventh century, not one. No Muslim can come up with them. I've asked this for 40 years. The European scholars, we are all asking, if these are from the seventh century, show me one. Listen, this should be easy for Muslims to reveal, why? Because we can go back to the Sinaiticus from the fourth century, you can go to the Alexandrinus from the fifth century, you can go to the Vaticanus, which is in the fourth century, we have the entire New Testament from the fourth and fifth century, that's two to 300 years earlier. If we can provide three metropolitan codices from the first, fourth and fifth century, why can't they come up with one Quran of the five from the seventh century? Not one. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. Thank God for my Bible. Thank God we have preserved our manuscripts. Thank God. Listen, not just those three metropolitan codices. By the 6th century, we have 65, either partial or complete New Testaments by the 6th century. If you want to talk about what we have in our hands today, we have 8,500 New Testament manuscripts. We have 10,000 Latin Vulgates. We have 19,000 in 11 different languages. If we had wanted to change any one of them, we would have to go back to, that's 24,000 manuscripts. We'd have to go back to, oh, excuse me, all 24,000 manuscripts in all 11 languages, change every one of them so they agree. To me, that's a greater miracle. The fact that we don't have to change one of them shows how amazing our Bible is. We don't have this problem. This is only 1,400 years ago and they can't even come up with one manuscript. Now look at those five cities. Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus, they have been controlled by Muslims for 1400 years. There has been no floods, there have been no wars, I don't know of any fires, so why aren't they there today? Either this is complete ineptitude, or they never existed. I choose the latter. Now, note, there were at least five Qurans in the seventh century from Medina, Mecca, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. 
Conclusion, we don't even have one of them today. In fact, all we have are six of the earliest extant Quranic manuscripts, so let's look at them. These are the six earliest Qurans we have in existence today. Three of them I have in my, in my office, facsimiles of them, of, uh, f- full-size facsimiles of them in my office, not the originals, obviously. <clears throat> that is the top copy there. The top copy is there in Istanbul. That one is about 99% of the Quran. It is dated to the late late or middle to late eighth century. It's not a seventh century Quran. It's the best Quran they have because it is probably the closest to what we have today. But it has 2,270 manuscript variants. That means letters, words, and phrases in that Quran that do not parallel the Quran we have today. And yet that's the best they've got. Then you have the Samarkand manuscript over here. That's in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. That one there only goes up to Surah 43. It only goes up to the uh, the 43rd Surah. That means half the Quran is missing. And even amongst the 43 Surahs that you see there, 16 of them don't even exist. There's only one Surah that is complete and all the others have manuscript variants, have hundreds of manuscript variants. In fact, so many manuscript variants, it has lazy Arabic. Whoever wrote it didn't know Arabic very well. So most Muslim scholars say don't even read it. It's an embarrassment. Then you have the Ma'il manuscript, which is on the left there. That's right there in the British Library, the, in the Ribback Gallery. That one is also goes up to 43, Surah 43, so it's only half the Quran. What's interesting about it, it, it is uh, written in a, around the late eighth century. The one though before that, the Samarkand is the mid eighth century. This one is the late eighth century, this one here. And notice that it has a slanted text. So it is considered to be one of the earliest manuscripts, but it only, it's missing much of the Quran. It's missing half of the Quran to be exact with hundreds of manuscript variants. And then you have the Petropolitanus, which is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, there in France. And when you look at that, it is also a slanted text like the one over there, the Ma'il text. It only has 23% of the Quran. And within the 23%, there are 90 three manuscript variants. That means words or phrases that are different in that manuscript from the Quran we have today. Then we go to the next page and you see the Husseini manuscript. The Husseini manuscript you see on the left there. It's in Cairo in Egypt. It's a monumental text. Take a look at it. It's huge. It's massive. It is from the ninth century. It has a lot of coverings. You can't really see it. We're going to show you some other pages later on. Covering after covering after covering where they have manuscript, they have censored the text. Hundreds of them there. But the most exciting Quran is this one here on the right. This is the Sana manuscript discovered in 1975. It, if you look carefully, you will notice that there's Surah 19 there and then it jumps to Surah 22. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Where that yellow mark is? You, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. If you look over here, you will see 20 begins on this side. There's Surah 20, but they, you, notice, are, you notice there are two completely different scripts between the two pages? This is a completely different script. There's about 60 to 70 years between those two pages. What's more, do you see an orange mark? See where all the orange marks are there? Every time you see an orange mark, that is a manuscript variance. There is over a thousand of these words and phrases that's no longer in our Quran today. Proving that this is one of the earliest manuscripts. In fact, this is considered to be probably the earliest manuscript dated to 705, early 8th century. And yet it is full of manuscript variants. Summary of these manuscripts. When we look at the six earliest Quranic manuscripts, we find that none of them are from the 7th century. None of them are complete. None of them completely agree with each other. None of them completely agree with the current 1924 Huff's text. That's this book I have in my hand today. All of them have hundreds and even thousands of subsequent manuscript variants. So when was the complete first complete Quran? Could we have recently discovered an older example? What about this one here, the Sana Palamsin? When you look at the Sana and you put it into under ultraviolet light, you notice that there's an underlayer. That's what a palimpsest is. That means it was written on animal skin and then it was washed off and written over top. And when you write it over top, the, what you wash off disappears. But hundreds of years later, the ink starts to bleed through. So you can see the bleeding through right there. So they put it under ultraviolet light and this is what they have found. That the underlayer is from the last two decades of the seventh century. This is the, by far the earliest part of the Quran. But what was interesting, when you look at the, ver- the lower text, there are 63 verses in that lower text from the late seventh century. There are 70 variants between the upper and lower text. 25 times there are verbs and nouns and articles and participles and junctions that are different. 29 times there are isolated letters, prepositions, 
phrases and expressions that are different between the two layers 16 times, their entire sentences. Some overlap within the same verses. Asma Hilali looked at this and she was, as a Muslim, said, well, this is nothing more than a school text. What she was saying is these are students who were practicing and therefore they made all these mistakes so the teacher washed it off and wrote over top. No, you don't give animal skins to students. They're highly expensive. Only scholars would ever be able to get to animal skins because you have to cure the animals. These are the most expensive writing material. You give them papyrus. You don't give them vellum and you don't give them parchments. These are obviously done by scholars. So Dr. Elizabeth Quinn, who's done the most work on the, on the manuscript, said that these are an example of a nascent Quran, the lower layer, with corrections then washed off and rewritten in 705. That's why you see an evolution in the Quranic text by the early 8th century. Some say they even, there might be one even older Quran, and this is the, what we call the Birmingham Quran. You heard about this in 2015 when they discovered these two folios. Now, folks, that's not a whole Quran. That's just two pages front and back. When you look at it, you notice it's just two pages front and back. It's only 63 verses. There are 6,236 verses in the Quran, so that's not the whole Quran. Uh, 63 verses, even within the three surahs that it contains, there are 343 verses in those three chapters. That's not nearly the full chapters. What's more, they're not even the same sequence that's in the Quran that we have today. What's interesting is when you read those, three, those two pages, read what's in them. These are stories that are nothing to do with the Quran. In chapter 18, verse 7, to 31, it talks about the seven sleepers of Ephesus. This is a Christian legend written by Metaphrastes in 521 AD. This is pre Quranic, pre Islamic. Yes, you can see this was written long before the Quran came into existence. Surah 1991 to 98 is a Syriac Christian and rabbinic apocryphal account by, of the Proto Evangelium of James, written in 145 AD. This is from the second century. And then Surah 20, verse 1 to 40, is the Bible story of Moses, written in 1400 BC. Conclusion, these folios, front and back, are pre-Quranic, pre-Muhammad, and thus pre-Islamic, written by Christian, Jews, and secular Arab writers, and then simply borrowed by the later Muslims for their own revelation in the 8th to 10th century. Folks, if you take a book and you have to come up with a book real quickly because you now have a prophet, where do you think you get your book from? You borrow it, do you not? You go to Christian sectarian writings. You go to Jew Jewish apocryphal writings. You go to Zoroastrian writings and you just amalgamate and put them into a text. Now do you realize when you read the Quran, there's no chronology in the Quran. Have you noticed? Those of you who have read it, stories don't begin, stories don't end. It jumps all over the place. Boom, 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 boom. Why? Because that's what you do when you borrow. And if you borrow something, they have to exist before what you borrowed. Am I correct? So of course there's Arabic writing. There's lots of Arabic writing. There's no dots and vowels in it. These are what we're going to find out exactly what the Quran is full of. But hold on, that's yet to come. Now, my good friend, Dr. Dan Brubaker, has probably done one of the most devastating work. Back in 2010, he decided to do his doctorate on the manuscripts themselves. He, started, he was the first one to actually go to the manuscripts, to all these six plus another four manuscripts, all the earliest manuscripts, and filmed every page <clears throat> looking for manuscript variants. Now, these are consonantal variants. That means these are, the, these are not the vowels, these have nothing to do with the dots, these are the consonants, 16 consonants that existed in Arabic. So he started taking pictures. And what he was looking for, he was looking for just maybe one error, one difference between one manuscript and another. By the time he finished his doctorate in 2014, he had found over 800 variants, 800 variants. He wrote his doctorate, Passed his doctor with flying colors, sent me his manuscript, and I debated Dr. Shabirai, the world's leading debater in 2014 in Canada on those six manuscripts, just looking at his material. Have any of you seen that debate? That debate, over two million people have watched. We know over a hundred Muslims that have come to Jesus Christ because of that one debate. Because that debate destroyed the Quran 10 years ago using his research. Now that was in 2014. Dr. Shabir Ali had no response. He had never looked at these manuscripts. He had no idea what he was up against. His only response was, who cares about what you have found? Who cares if they're not complete? Who cares if they don't agree with each other? 
I look at the Quran today, when you look at these set of verses and you look at these set of verses, you get the number 19. When you look at these verses and these verses, you get the number 19. When you look at these words and these words, you get 19, 19, 19. He talked about the miracle of the number 19. I went back after the debate and asked and looked to see how much time he had taken to, to regale us on the miracle of the number 19. He took a lack exactly 19 minutes. That was the miracle. He had no idea what he was talking about. I said, what are you referring to? What set of verses? None of these are the same. What set of verses are you? There's no versification in any of these manuscripts. What manuscript are you referring to? What Quran are you referring to? There's no, even today's Quran, the verses are not the same. What are you referring to? It took me 30 minutes for him to finally admit what he was talking about. He was talking about this Quran. This is the 1924 Hafs Quran. This is the Quran that's used all over the world today and it's only 100 years old. It was chosen in Cairo by one man, Muhammad Al-Huzaini Al-Haddad, as the official Quran. This is the one that has the verses he's talking about. That's only 100 years old. By the end of that debate, he had no rebuttal. Within two months, he had to write nine pages because the Muslims were hounding him all over the world, saying, how did you lose that debate? How come you couldn't come up with something better than that? He had to write a rebuttal. And in his nine pages, he kept on talking about the miracle of the number 19. What a waste of time. Dr. Shabit Ali will not debate me anymore because of that debate 10 years ago. Can you see how this just shuts down the Quran? When you look at the manuscripts, take a look at what he has found. If you look here, you can see, here you can see that there, these are insertion. There's a word that's insertion above the line. See how it's inserted there? Here's another one. These are erasures. See how they've erased there, they've erased there, they've erased there. We have no idea what the word was before, but now when they have erased it, notice what they have done. Every time they've inserted a word there or asserted a letter, every time they have erased it, what they've left behind now supports this book right here. Supports the Huff's text from 1924. Then they have erases overwritten. So if they've erased it and they've just overwritten over top, you can tell it's two different words. Can you notice that? Even not the same number of letters. Here, they did it in the red ink. They didn't even care if you didn't notice it or not. What was left over now supports the Huff's text. And then they overwrote. Here they overwrote, sometimes above the line, sometimes different color. Here they overwrote an entire two, entire two sentences. They didn't care if you could see it or not. They were not worried about that because they didn't, they didn't think anybody would look for this. Well, Dan Brubaker found this. And then most devastating are these selective coverings. See, there's a covering there, there's a covering there. You see that? There's a covering there. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight coverings on just that one page. What's left over just look like chicken scratches. But what's left over now supports the Huff's text. This is censorship at its greatest. They're centering the text to standardize it to fit that text from 1924. Here you can see another cover, another cover, another cover. Look at that. Those are coverings. And sometimes they covered it and they wrote over top. So there they've covered it and they wrote over top. There they've covered it and written over top. There you can see. There they've covered, not written over anything, but there you can see where they've covered it and there they've covered it over it. This is censorship, standardization of a text. And sometimes they just put a patch over it. He thought maybe that was because it was damaged. When he looked on the other side, there was no damage whatsoever. That's censorship. Folks, these insertions, these erasers, these coverings, these patches suggest wholesale censorship during the 700 period that during the Ottoman Empire because they controlled all of these manuscripts. They were the ones that chose the Huff text. This is censorship at its worst. Standardizing the text in each of these manuscripts to support the 1924 Huff's Razum text, the Huff's text because the Ottomans had chosen the rough text. They had 700 years to standardize all of these manuscripts. Now, I wanted to take down his material down to speaker's corner, so I got up on the ladder, and there is Hatun Tosh, my colleague that I was talking about earlier. She's the one that's been beaten up. She's been stabbed. They've broken her ribs. They've broken her feet. She's been hung, and yet she's still living because Jesus Christ will preserve her until he's ready to take her home. She is a tigress for Jesus Christ. As we got on the ladder there, this man here, Mansur Ahmed, got on the ladder with him. Mansur Ahmed is probably one of the leading authorities on the manuscripts on the Quran. He controls all the manuscripts on the Islamic Awareness website that's up uh, there in Cambridge University. So he got on the ladder to confront us and he started making claims. I'm not gonna, uh, the, you can watch the video, it's on Fender Films. And he started saying, listen, uh, we don't care about these, these manuscripts we have found. We know that we can trace we can trace the Quran all the way back to the time of Uthman. So I said, oh, that's interesting. Uthman, 652. You have a manuscript that's 114 surahs. 
Not one word, not one letter has changed, exactly like the Quran we have today. And he was quiet. I said, where is that manuscript? He didn't want to say. I said, well, what about the seventh century? He didn't want to answer. I said, well, then, what's, the? he said, it's within the first century AH, after Hijrah. That means between 622 and 719, that he could find a complete Quran. I said, a complete Quran by 719? Can you tell me what manuscript you're talking about? He says, we have 97% of the Quran by the first century age. By 719, we have 97%. What is he talking about? You want to know, don't you? Let's take a look. Just go up on his Islamic Awareness website. And that's what he's talking about. 63 fragments. Those are not, it's not one manuscript. It's 63 fragments. That's half the Quran right there. That's the 2165. That's the Ma'il Quran that's there in the British gal- gal- Ridback Gallery there on the British Library. That only is half the Quran. That only goes up to Surah 43. That's the best they've got. All the rest are nothing more than fragments, fragments all the way down to one verse or two verses. And when you add them all 63 together, you get 97% of the Quran. Assuming, therefore, that every one of these manuscripts and these fragments are before he didn't know that we'd go and check him up on it. So we did. I had my team go check him up, and this is what we found. 20 of them, the ones that I'm putting up right now in the green, are tentatively dated with disagreements. That means these have no one had come to any conclusion because people are still debating them. We have no idea whether any of them are prior to 719. Notice that three of them are three of the largest ones that they have up there on the graph. Nine of them, including the largest one, the male one, which comes from the late 8th century, is not before 719. He should have never used those ones in blue right there. None of them are from before 719. They're all after 719. Well, what about the other 34? If you look at the other 34, no one's done any work on any of them. Therefore, they have no idea what dates they are. No one's ever come up with any conclusion. And therefore, they used them because they needed them, not thinking that we would hold them accountable before them. When you look at every one of these 63 fragments, what are our conclusions? The conclusions are that none of them are really valid, since all of them are either later or tentatively dated or have no supporting evidence. Now we come to probably the most devastating material. This is the stuff the Hatun Tosh found, and this is why they want to kill her. The Kidats. How many know what the Kidats are? Raise of hands. None of you. Woo. Okay, this is going to all be near to you. This is new for all of you. Okay. The Kidats are the readings of the Quran. Now remember, Arabic was used in the Quran today. It does not the same as the Arabic that was used in the Quran in the Hijaz in the 7th century. The Arabic was Nabataean Aramaic with only 16 letters. And therefore the Rosm, the, 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 the letters, the Rosm, what we know, the consonantal text, did not have any dots. A single consonantal letter could be pronounced five to eight different ways, depending on where you put the dots and the vowels. But remember, these dots and vowels did not exist in the 7th century. Thus in the 8th century, the Ijams, the dots, and the Haraka, which are the vowels, had to be created for that reason, because no one could read them. As you, who are Arab speakers, you can't read those manuscripts. You need to have dots and vowels. So th- let me just give you an example. Here is a normal letter in Arabic. It's just a smiley face. You put one dot, it becomes a na or an n. Two dots becomes a ta or a t. Three dots becomes a tha or a th. One dot below becomes a ba or a b. Two dots becomes a ya. So, na, ta, tha, ba, ya. Those dots are needed to make to be distinguished between five different letters. But those were all created in the 8th and ninth century. They did not exist in the 7th century. And then you have the three vowels. The dama, which is the u sound. The kasra, which is the e sound below the letter. And then the fata, which is the a sound. Now, when you look at those dots and vowels and the different vowels, if you take three letters together and you put dots and vowels where you want to, you can get 19 different words. That's why you had to have dots and vowels but they were all created two to 300 years later. So that what we now have today are all these Qurans with different dots and vowels. Everybody started putting their dots and vowels where they wanted to. So you live in Kufa, you put your dots and vowels where you want to, your name is Hafs. Now you live in Cairo and you decide that you're gonna put your dots and vowels where you want to and your name is Warsh. But you live in Mecca, Medina, so you, your name is Al Ibn Kathir, so you put your dots and vowels where you want to. And you don't even look at each other's books and so you come up with completely different Qurans and your family memorizes yours and those people in Cairo memorize yours and those in Middle East, sorry, in Saudi Arabia memorize yours, but they're completely different. Well, don't just stop with you. Every one of you here starts to put your dots and vowels. By the 10th century, there are 700 different Qurans. Did you hear me? 700 different Qurans, all written by 700 different men all over the Middle East. There was a dilemma. 
Now I'm gonna show you 26. These are the 26 that Hatun Tosh found just by going to Jordan, going to South Northern Africa, going to Yemen, and going to Syria. She found these 26 by 2016. She came and she showed me these 26, and not one of those 26 are alike. These you can buy today, folks. She bought them in different bookstores all over the Middle East. We took them down to Speaker's Corner. But what are they read? These are, the 20, these are 26 of the 30 that exist. Here are the first seven that were created and chosen by Ibn Mujahid. Look at the date, 936. Notice every one of those writers died in 785, 736, 770, 736, 745, 752, and 805. They're all 8th and 9th century writers, right? None of them knew Muhammad. None of them were living when Muhammad was living. They were all creating their Qurans ex nihilo. Can you see that? They weren't good enough. They needed a lot more, so they had to choose some more. So a man named al Shatabi chose two students from every one of those seven. So now you have 14 others chosen to add to the seven. Now you have 21 different Qurans by 1194, by the 12th century. We're talking about 500 years after Muhammad. Those still weren't enough. They had to choose another three Qirats and another six of their students. So you have al Jazari choose another three Qirats and a, f- a six more students. So now you have nine. Seven plus 21, sorry, seven plus 14 plus three. Three plus six makes 30 different Qurans. By the end of the 15th century, 800 years after Muhammad, you now have 30 Qurans. 30 official Qurans chosen out of the 700. You're looking at them. But when you look at them on the internet, they're all there. None of them have their dates on them. No Muslim wants you to see their dates. Look at their dates. Look when they died. They all died in the 8th and 9th and 10th century. Hundreds of years after Muhammad. Not one of them is from that time period. But the one that was chosen is this one I've just circled, the Huffs. How many differences between this one and the other 29? We've now found out 93,000 differences. 93,000 different words, which means 93,000 different letters, which means 93,000 different theology, different doctrines, different practices. There is not just one Quran. There are 30 Qurans with 93,000 differences. These two I have right today are the three, the two, the two most popular. This is the water, this is yours from uh, Cairo, and this is yours, this is from Kufa. This was written in 796, this one was written in 812. There are 5,000 differences just between these two Qurans. That's all you need is just these two. 93% of the Muslim world memorizes this one. 3% of the Muslim world memorizes this one. All the ones in North Africa memorize this one. Can you see why they cannot give up memorizing because they're completely different Qurans. They have to keep to their Qurans. Now, we showed them at Speaker's Corner in 2016 and boy, the world went berserk as we filmed and put it up on the internet. But there was a man there who was watching what was going on. His name is Muhammad Hijab, that's him right there. And he he completely went outside the group and he said, people come to me, I'll explain what's going on. Well, that was in 2006 and he didn't know what was going on. So two, four years later, he decided he had to do something. This is what happened. He had to go to this man here, the world's leading authority on the Kirat. He was the one that did a doctoral degree at Yale University on this very problem in 1995. He got his doctorate. Therefore, he's the world's leading official. He lives in Houston, speaks fluent English and Arabic and Urdu. He's from Pakistan. His name is Dr. Yasser Qadi. He is all over the internet. If you go up on the internet, he has over a half a million followers. So Mohammed Hijab from London, who is there at the corner, who has a following of 600,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, wanted to ask, Yes, Sir Qadi, what he's going to do. And the first question he said, I'm going to put out a blank sheet, a blank hand. Which Quran are you going to write? Which is the eternal Quran? Is it Hafs? Is it Warsh? Is it Ibn Kathir? Is it Kalub? Before he could finish, uh, Yes, Sir Qadi said, do not ask me this question. We do not talk about this in public. Turn off your camera. He had no idea we were all watching and recording what he was saying. And then he says, the Ahruf and the Kirat are the most difficult topic for scholars. You do not tell the new converts about, of Islam about the Kirat. Only with the more advanced students do you do deep dive on this issue. Ask me after this interview and I'll tell you about it. For the last thousand years, scholars do not have an answer for this problem. Muslims respect the Quran. He says, we have a red line beyond which we don't go. So Muhammad Hijab, was that what happened to you there at Yale University when you had a crisis of faith? No, 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 not a crisis of faith, a crisis of knowledge. He says, I still believe it's the word of God. He says, here in the West, there are no red lines. At Yale University, you can ask any question you want. The standard narrative, he says, you, your standard narrative has holes in it. 
That's why we call it the standard narrative. What narrative is that? The standard Islamic narrative, S-I-N. Well, we know sin has holes in it all over the place. Of course it has holes, but he was the one that coined the phrase, and that was in October, what is the date? That was June the 8th, 2020. He said, the Western academics have come leaps and bounds on this issue. They look at the rest of us like emperors with no clothes. I've never lectured on this subject for the last 25 years. This subject should never be brought up in public. Turn off your camera. Do not ask me this. They say, which was written on the blank Muslim? Because he asked him a second time, which one are you going to write? He says, do not ask me this question. When he finally asked him the third time, he said, okay, okay. He finally had to give in. He said, they are all the Quran. You mean a little bit of huffs, a little bit of wash? A little, yes, a little bit of every one of these. You just mix them all together and that's the Quran we have to. I started clapping. I said, he had no idea what he was saying. He had no idea the trap he had just walked into. Because no longer after June 8, 2020, can now Muslims say there is one Quran that is completely preserved. Because the world's leading scholar has finally admitted there are many Qurans. No two are alike. Within two weeks, all the comments, I was looking at the comments on both of their YouTube sites. There were hundreds and hundreds of Muslims that were saying, I have no longer a Muslim. I've given up Islam because of that interview. And my blood is going to be on your shoulder. There were hundreds of Muslims that were leaving Islam because of that interview. Just 28 minute long interview. Within two weeks, they had to shut down all those comments. They could not let those comments go. Within two months, by August of 2020, they had to delete those interviews off of both of their sites. But I have it. It's right here in this computer. You can have it. Hatun has it. David Wood has it. Sam Shamoon, we all have it. And every June 8th, we bring it up again. And we have a celebration when the Quran was thrown under the bus by Dr. Yasar Qadi. See what YouTube can do? So, how did the Hafs come to be? How did they get this Quran that we have called the Hafs? This all happened 100 years ago in 1924 when they were there in high schools, just high school kids were coming with 20, 30 different answers to these standardized tests. They had a dilemma. So they went to Muhammad al Husseini Al-Haddad, who is a scholar there at Al-Hazad University, and he chose the Hafs Quran. Why? Because the Ottomans had chosen the Hafs Quran. So he used this Quran as the final Quran, and they took the other 29 Qurans and dumped them into the Nile, thinking that would get rid of them. What a stupid idea. That may get rid of them for Cairo, but not for the rest of the world. And then they decided that this would be the official Quran for just the university, I'm sorry, for just the high schools in Cairo. But they found that there were problems. There were lots of difficulties. There were grammatical errors. So they had to change it seven times. Finally, by 1936, they decided they finally caught the Farouk edition after seven different changes. They came up with the Farouk edition, which they made the Quran for all of Egypt. That became so successful that in 1985, King Fahd, who is uh, the, king, uh, the, the, the emir of Saudi Arabia, decided to make the Hafs Quran, the universal Quran for all the world. That was in 1985. How many of you here were alive in 1985? Raise your hands. That means every one of you that's raising your hand, you are older than the official Quran. Doesn't that make you feel old? The official Quran that every Muslim used today, or 93% of the Muslims used today, made to, by this man right here in 796, is only 39 years old. Ooh, that makes me feel old. Where did the material of the Quran come from? I'm gonna end with this, and this is the most devastating. This is the best one. So where did this Quran come from? Where did all this material come from? When you look at the Quran, you will notice that about 25% of it no one understands. These are known as the dark passages. This is the beautiful poetry that's in the Quran. A lot of it, none of the scholars can understand. They can't follow it, it doesn't make any sense. 25% of the Quran makes no sense. Can you imagine, what would our pastors do if 25% of the Bible made no sense? Thank God we don't have that problem with the Bible. We can understand every verse. Isn't it great? What a Bible we have. So here is a problem, and this scholar here, his name, Dr. Gunther Loding, is a good friend of mine. I went to see him. In 1970, he decided to look, and he noticed that a lot of this beautiful hymn, these beautiful poetry that you see in the Quran, that Muslims claim this must be from God, because how could an illiterate man write such beautiful poetry? He said, I've seen that before. So he decided to take the dots off. Remember I talked about the five dots and the three vowels? He took those dots and vowels off and got it down to its original consonantal text. And then he went to Syriac dots and vowels and put them back on. And when he put it back into the Syriac, 
he found that every one of this beautiful poetry were Christian hymns written in the 6th and 7th century. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. He wrote his doctorate, passed his doctorate. As a result, he got Examen Opus, which is the highest grade you can get in Germany. But within two years, he was thrown out of the university, thrown into obscurity, and he went on welfare for 30 years and his wife. I went to see him at the end of 1990s. I went to his home. I asked him about his doctoral thesis. He showed me and I says, can I take them back to in London with me? And I get them translated into English because no one can understand your German. Because this German, listen, the first sentence was 400 words long. This is high German. And I went through three translators in Britain to try to understand what this all made sense. We finally got it all translated into English. We sent it back to him. That's it there in the yellow. He then got it printed up in India and he went all over the world and he has now been resurrected. He's back. He was back in academia and he died a happy man by 2015 just because we got it translated into English. Christoph Luxemburg, that's not his real name, another German scholar, it's all coming out of Germany, decided to go one step further. He wanted to do what Gunther Lulling did, but he wanted to go look to all this dark passage that no one understands. And he went through seven different layers. He first looked at the Al-Tabari's 10th century tafsir, the commentary, and he couldn't find any help there. He then looked at the Listen al-Arab, the tongue of the Arabs, the Arabic dictionary, he couldn't find any help there. And then he went and looked at the homonymous synonyms in the Aramaic. Then started, he started seeing things happen. Then he tried different diacritics, taking off the five dots, putting on the other Aramaic dots, the Syro Aramaic dots. And then he looked for Aramaic roots with different diacritics, and then he retranslated the Arabic word back into the Aramaic using the semantics of the Syro Aramaic words, trying to find the lost meanings of these Arab words using 10th century Syro Aramaic lexicons. He was able to translate every one of the dark passages. But guess what he found? By translating it back to the Syro-Aramaic, all the dark passages were Christian lectionaries, Christian homilies, and Christian hymns all to Jesus Christ. It's not what he found, it's who he found. All of these beautiful poetry, all this beautiful part of the Quran, it was all from Christian lectionaries, Christian homilies, and Christian hymns. Folks, you know what that means? That means we need to go back and take the Quran back to its roots. We need to take the Quran back to the Syriac roots. And what we're going to do, we're in the process of doing that now. We're going to bring the Quran home. Now, remember I told you to memorize four words? I told you that the Quran was eternal, sent down, complete, and unchanged. That's what the Muslims claim, right? Have we shut down eternality tonight? Yep. How about sent down? We shut that down tonight? Complete? No, none of it's complete. None of the earliest manuscripts are complete. Unchanged? 93,000 changes. And that's just the diacritical changes. 4,000 consonantal changes that Dan Brubaker has found since 2014. The last 10 years, he's found 4,000 changes, and he's still counting. So pretty much we've shut those down. No longer can Muslims claim that the Quran is eternal or sent down or complete or unchanged. We've shut that down. And we would never make that claim about our Bible. Please don't. Our Bible is not eternal, nor was it sent down. Complete, yes, the original manuscripts. We don't have the original manuscript. Change, we know where the changes are because they're right there. We're very transparent about it. But see, the Bible is not the only word of God we have, right? There's another word of God, the Logos. Jesus, is he also not called the Lord of God? Yes, in John 1, he is our eternal word of God. Let's ask these four questions of Jesus. Is Jesus eternal? Number one, was he sent down? Number two, is he complete? Number three, has he changed? Never. Everything the Muslims are looking for, we have in Jesus Christ. Most folks, listen. The four criteria Muslims are looking for in their Quran, their primary revelation, we already have in Jesus Christ our primary revelation. In conclusion, let's bring them home to a much greater and a much better revelation. His name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. I've got to catch my plane. I have two minutes before I leave, but folks, I want to end in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this has been a good night because we've unpacked probably the most devastating material that shuts down the whole foundations of everything Muslims believe. They believe in one book, one man, in one place. We've shut down that place quite easily. The man's a little bit more difficult. The place even 
more difficult. But Lord, just by going back to that time, that place, in the seventh century, in the middle part of Arabia, we pretty well know there was no Muhammad, there was no Quran, and there certainly was no Mecca. But see, we don't have that problem, Lord. You have made sure that you have left these coins for us to look at. You have made sure that you've left these inscriptions and these manuscripts and these buildings. You have made sure that if we're not going to cry out, the rocks are going to cry out for us. Lord, you have kept all these beautiful pieces, these gems all through the desert so that we can find out who you were, what you did, what you said, and we can trust what has been written about you because it was written by those who actually knew you, who were with you for the last three years of your life. Lord, we have passed every one of these tests. These are tests that we have always had to do for the last 2,000 years. Since the 1800s, we have had to pass these tests to prove that you did exist, to prove that you did die, and especially to prove that you rose again. And we have proved every one of those, which means we are the most best capable to do the same with Islam and any other religion that shows its face and claims to be historical. So Lord, help us to get beyond this fear. Give us the courage to take that which you have given us, to not hide it under a bushel, to expose it to the world and expose it to the, to the Muslims, our be- beautiful, lovely men and women who I love, who have been changed and, dis- and completely destroyed by one book and one man. Lord, help us bring them home. Let's bring them home to you. Take them away from Allah back to Yahweh. Take them away from Muhammad back to Jesus Christ, to you, Lord. Take them away from the Quran and back to your scripture and your gospel. And Lord, help us to do that with every Muslim we meet. So Lord, as we leave tonight, we ask that we take this message with us and that we use it, that we don't hide it. And Lord, that we use it with our Muslim friends because they need it more than anybody else and they're growing faster than anybody else. We need to actually bring them home. What would it be to have that many souls who become Paul's? Can you imagine these most radical Muslims bringing them to you? And Lord, what you can do with them. And so, Lord, we ask that you help us to understand this material and use it for your glory, for your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, I have two questions. I'm going to end with these two questions. I said I was going to ask you two questions at the end. Don't get up yet. Just stay here. How many of you understood everything you saw tonight? Raise of hands. Not exhaustively, but how many understood Okay, about half of you. How many, if I gave you this PowerPoint, could actually use it and actually teach it yourself? Look at that. Wow. See how easy this is? This is by far the easiest material I've ever used. In 40 years, I've never had it this easy. It's all visual. You notice? It's maps. It's timelines. It's coins. It's inscriptions. It's manuscripts. Notice none of you had to learn Arabic to learn what what we were saying tonight. You don't have to learn all about these great, these terrible, these difficult arguments in the Hadith and the traditions. You don't have to memorize any of this. You don't even have to look at the Quran. Don't even read the Quran. What a waste of time. Let me do that. All you have to do is ask those questions. And one of the easiest questions is, where's your evidence? Have you done your research? How can you claim Mecca existed? There's no water there. What are you going to do without water? You can't have a civilization. You can't even have a Quran. All these questions, every one of those slides is an argument in themselves. And you can have these slides now. You can have every one of these. I've got to leave. You're going to stay. I hope you meet Muslims. They're all around you. Listen, please, whenever you go up to a Muslim, always ask them or say two things to every Muslim you meet. I believe Jesus is God. I believe the Bible is the word of God. Do you have an opinion? They'll have hundreds of opinions. But show the evidence that we have for our Bible, our book, and our man, Jesus Christ. So much evidence. They have nothing in return. God bless you. We'll see you again. I'm off.